Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 18th meeting in 2014 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I uh, welcome members, welcome our uh, witnesses, who I'll introduce in a second, and welcome visitors to the uh, public gallery. Uh, and can I remind everyone, please, to turn off, or at least turn to silent, all mobile phones and other electronic devices so they don't interfere with the sound equipment. Uh, we have apologies this morning from Dennis Robertson, who has to be uh, elsewhere, and we're joined by Stuart Maxwell, who's a substitute on the committee. And as this is Mr Maxwell's first uh, attendance at this committee, I have to ask you, Mr Maxwell, if you have any interests relevant to the work of the committee that you wish to declare. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, relevant interests I need to declare, uh, convener, but obviously I would point members and others to my register of interests. Thank you very much. OK, we have three items on the agenda <coughs> this morning relating to uh, our inquiry on Scotland's economic future post-2014, and this is the last day we'll be taking evidence on the inquiry. And I'd like to welcome our first panel uh, and welcome back to the committee the Right Honourable Danny Alexander, uh, MP, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, who is joined by uh, the Right Honourable Alistair Carmichael, MP, who is the Secretary of State for Scotland, who I think is the first time you've been to this committee. Yep. Welcome. And you're joined this morning by... Uh, Stephen Farrington, who is the Deputy Director of the Economics Group at HM Treasury. Uh, and I think the last time you were here, you were tipped to be the next Permanent Secretary of the Treasury. So the you, can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can update us how your career path is getting on. And then uh, also uh, Chris Flatt, who is Deputy Director, Constitution and Communications at the Scotland Office. Welcome to you all. Now, um, We've got about uh, 90 minutes or so for uh, this session. Can I remind members, if they would, to keep their uh, questions uh, short and to the point, and then we can have responses that are as short and focused as possible to allow us to get through the, the topics in the time available. That would be very helpful. Um, I, I'm not sure if uh, members want to direct their questions to a particular individual, but maybe you can just agree between yourselves who's going to answer uh, any questions that, that are asked. Can I maybe just start off and... and ask, I don't know, maybe, maybe yourself, Mr Alexander and Mr Carmichael, if you want to come in, but if you could just set out for us why you think the Scottish economy would benefit from a no vote in the referendum in September. And maybe try and answer that if you can, maybe you know, two to three minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Chairman, for inviting me back. It feels like only days since I was here uh, for, the, I think, the opening uh, session of this, uh, of this inquiry, and it's a very good opportunity to to, to, to hear the arguments and have the debate. And I'm here, obviously, both as Chief Secretary to the Treasury, but also as a Member of Parliament for Inverness, Nairn, Bednach and Strass Bay, and therefore as someone who has a number of uh, direct interests in the matters under discussion today. Um, I, I think that I'd make just two or three points in, in, in answering your opening question. Firstly, Scotland's economic performance is very strong as part of the uh, United Kingdom. Um, I think that working together within the UK creates economic opportunities, more jobs in Scotland, in a whole range of sectors, but particularly uh, energy, financial services, uh, defence uh, and others. I think that some of the evidence that, that we've produced as part of the Scotland Analysis Programme shows from a, from a macroeconomic perspective the damaging effect that uh, erecting an international border has on, on, on trade flows uh, and therefore uh, on job uh, on, on job creation. Just a couple of weeks ago, I published the most recent paper, Scotland Analysis, Fiscal Policy and Sustainability, which I'm sure your committee's had a chance to, uh, to, to, to look at, which, which looks in the round all of the uh, fiscal issues that would affect an uh, independent Scotland. It looks uh, at the starting point in terms of the uh, much larger budget deficit that Scotland would expect to have in 2016-17 compared to uh, the rest of the UK. It looks at the uh, rapid uh, decline in oil revenues, the uh, uh, extra costs of an ageing population, um, the, uh, the higher bond yields that could expect to be paid uh, uh, according to a lot of independent evidence uh, under, uh, under independence, and brings all that together uh, to make clear that there is a, uh, a UK dividend to every single Scot uh, of around £1,400 every year in terms of uh, lower taxes and sustained public spending uh, as part of the, uh, of the United Kingdom. I think the thing that's been striking to me over the past few weeks is the degree to which uh, each of those building blocks is supported by uh, independent 
uh, evidence. So, for example, uh, on the point about the starting deficit and the divergence between uh, oil revenues and, uh, and demographic costs, the Institute for Fiscal Studies just very recently published their own report, very much bearing out uh, the analysis uh, in our paper on oil revenues. Uh, we see from the uh, OBR's forecasts uh, 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 decline, and it's quite interesting, the Scottish Government uh, on the same day that I published this paper brought out a new uh, oil and gas uh, forecast, which is uh, just as hyper-over-optimistic as their previous forecasts um, and leaves, uh, I think, a, 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 a massive hole in the financial case uh, for, uh, for independence. We've also heard other uh, independent commentators on the financial sector and, and, and other places uh, supporting the argument that a currency union simply is not uh, uh, going to happen or would not uh, would, would not work. And so I think that th there may be many other uh, uh, arguments around um, uh, around whether or not Scotland should become independent. I think from the point of view uh, of the economic arguments, which is, uh, I guess, the subject of this uh, of this committee, I think I would say that all of the independent evidence that, that, that has emerged in, in recent weeks supports the idea that Scotland is economically stronger and more successful, has the best of both worlds, if you like, as part of the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. Mr. Carmichael, do you want to add anything at this stage? Uh, just very briefly, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I think uh, Chief Secretary has given you a fairly uh, concise and very clear summary of uh, the, the case from which I would not depart in any way, shape or form. Um, but I think it might just uh, benefit the committee uh, to pause for a moment and to reflect about the state of Scotland's economy today as part of the United Kingdom. Um, some six minutes ago, uh, the latest employment figures uh, have been released, and they show that uh, employment in Scotland increased by 16,000 over the last quarter, unemployment in Scotland fell by 7,000 over the quarter, and the number of people seeking jobs, is claiming job seekers allowance, fell by 2,300 over the month of May. The unemployment rate in Scotland has now fallen to 6.6%, which is the same uh, as for the UK as a whole. Those people returning to work find they have also been helped by the increases to the personal allowance by this government, which have taken 242,000 Scots out of paying income tax altogether. One million Scottish pensioners have benefited from having their pensions protected by the government's triple lock on the state pension. The GDP has now risen for seven consecutive quarters, and although in the last quarter of 2013, the growth of GDP in Scotland was only 0.2% compared to 0.7% for the rest of the UK. I think it's worth pausing just to reflect on why that should be, and I think there is a fairly broad consensus that, in fact, it was a, as a result of the temporary closure of the Grangemouth plant a, last October. Mm. I would just suggest to the committee that that is a reminder of why it is better to be part of a larger economy where we spread the risks and share the rewards. And also remind the committee that, in fact, in tackling that real threat to the Scottish economy, uh, I was delighted and indeed privileged to work very closely with John Swinney. Uh, and I think the fact that Scotland's two governments worked together in that way was ultimately to the benefit uh, of Scotland. I'm not going to pretend that everything in the garden is rosy. We've had to take some tough decisions, and we're not clear of the woods yet, but there is room for optimism, uh, particularly in relation to the Scottish economy. And the critical point in relation to the economy that you're, uh, the, the inquiry that your uh, committee is conducting that needs to be emphasised is that what has been achieved has happened precisely because Scotland is part of the United Kingdom, rather than despite it. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, opening statements. Just a small process point. I'm technically not the chairman of the committee. I'm the convener. Not that I'm precious about it in any way, but uh, uh, no doubt we'll... We, we, for the offence cause. We will get, Mr. We will get, we will get complaints. Um, it's, yeah. Right. Can I maybe just follow up, Mr Alexander, a point you touched on in your, in your opening statement about um, oil and gas, because this is something that's been a lot of substantial interest to the committee. In fact, we did a session in uh, Aberdeen University with the oil and gas sector, and we heard about the importance of oil and gas to the Scottish economy uh, and how significant that has been. And we've also uh, heard a lot about the impact oil and gas has in relation to the public finances in Scotland and the contribution that the tax revenue 
pays in relation to our fiscal position. Um, you said that the Scottish Government have published updated figures um, as to their um, projections as to, to oil and gas revenues. What is the, the UK Government's uh, analysis of, of the, uh, the future prospects for the oil and gas sector? I think that the first point you made is, is a very important one, which is that the oil and gas sector is hugely important to the Scottish economy. It's hugely important uh, to the UK economy. Uh, there is no doubt that in recent years uh, we've seen the tax revenues from the oil and gas sector decline, and that is expected uh, to continue. Um, uh, and I think that we have a shared interest in... Uh, maximising the economic recovery from the North Sea, making sure that we can uh, eke out every last drop of, of, of oil and gas from the UK uh, continental shelf. And that's why we've taken decisions like, uh, for the first time in this coalition government, being clear with uh, oil companies about decommissioning relief on, 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 on North Sea equipment, uh, on field allowances for new uh, fields and so on. All of those things are, as it were, uh, sacrificing tax revenue in order to maximise economic activity uh, in the, the North Sea. And I suspect that's a trend that will need to continue because we have a wider economic interest in making sure that it lasts as long as possible. But that, I think, therefore, um, brings me to, uh, to, to two points uh, about how that sits within the, the, the context of the debate about uh, independence. Um, f first to say, um, on the forecasts, uh, the Scottish Government's forecasts uh, and, and therefore the, the, the figures that they publish for how they see the public finances in an independent Scotland uh, rely on, on North Sea revenues being consistently more than double the forecasts made by the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility. And that is despite uh, the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility's forecasts since 2010 themselves having overestimated UK oil revenues by 20% on average. Now, it was interesting that when the uh, Scottish Government published their new uh, oil and gas bulletin uh, on the same day that I launched our, our paper on fiscal policy, uh, they excluded any reference to what had actually happened in 2012-13 and 2013-14. They had, in previous forecasts, previous bulletins looked back at what had actually happened. So it didn't reveal how over-optimistic their previous forecasts had been compared to actual taxes received. Uh, the, the most cautious... Scottish Government forecasts from March 2013 were actually around £5 billion too high for those two years. Um, and so what that means is that, the, uh, 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 that, that, that any of the Scottish Government protect, uh, projections for independence are wrong because they are based on massively over-optimistic projections uh, and they're over-optimistic by comparison to forecasts which themselves have been shown to be uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the optimistic side. And that means that you just have this widening chasm between the revenues on the one side and the costs on the other, which uh, is one of the fundamental building blocks of the argument that says that there is a U substantial UK dividend because, of course, the, uh, uh, those fluctuations in oil revenues are absorbed uh, in the kind of pooling and sharing of resources that we have uh, in a wider United Kingdom. And, of course, because you then have that much more worrying and difficult fiscal position uh, under independence, I think any prom promises that uh, uh, the SNP seek to make uh, to the oil and gas sector about stability of future revenues have to be taken with a pinch of salt. Because, of course, if Scotland were to be independent, a Scottish government would, have to, would be faced with, uh, uh, under those circumstances, pretty serious decisions on either substantially cutting public expenditure or putting up taxes. Uh, and therefore, promises not to put up taxes, uh, I think, would have to be taken with a big pinch of salt. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of members who want to come in with supplementaries. Just, just before we get to that, just to follow up a point you've just made. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with the argument that, that um, you know, the SNP would put forward and say, ah, but there's been a substantial investment in the North Sea over the last, you know, couple of years, and that will all reap benefits in the future. But you, presumably you, you, would, you would think that's already reflected in the projections that, that have been produced. I very much welcome the investment that we've seen. Uh, that investment is uh, largely off the back of decisions that uh, the UK government has made, the coalition government has made in the last two or three years, particularly on decommissioning relief, particularly major investments off the back of new field allowances uh, that we have announced. Uh, obviously, we had the very important review by Sir Ian Wood putting in place a new uh, regulatory regime for the UK continental shelf. All of those things giving a sense of stability and certainty. 
Um, but what I'd say is that, if you like, uh, the North Sea is shifting from being a tax asset. Less, I think as a tax asset is declining because, because the policies that we have to put in place to ensure, which I think the whole committee, I hope, would want to see, that we maximise the North Sea's role as an economic asset, means that uh, in and of itself, um, we simply cannot expect to get tax revenues anything like we've seen in the past or indeed anything like uh, the, 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 the Scottish Government's forecasts, simply because uh, with tax revenues at those levels and tax rates at the levels that, that obviously lie behind those forecasts, you simply wouldn't get the investment um, that we need to have. You know, field allowances um, uh, are a very substantial tax break, effectively, to enable and to incentivise new investments to take place. I'm delighted that some multi-billion pound fields are being opened up off the back of those uh, allowances. Likewise, decommissioning relief. If you think about the, the cost of the multi-billion pound cost of decommissioning relief when spread across a much smaller population in Scotland becomes much harder to bear under independence than it would uh, with the, uh, the deep pockets and shared resources of the United Kingdom. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mike McKenzie has a supplementary. Yeah, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Mr Alexander has brought up the, the OBR projections and um, I wonder if you agree with me that OBR have not really done all that well in, in a number of uh, projections that they've made. But I wonder if um, you could explain to me why um, OBR predict that all prices will flatline from 2016 to 2017 at about $99 a barrel, a barrel when um, DEX, the government agency's own figures suggest that oil prices are going to continue upwards. They're talking about around about $132 uh, a barrel at that point and continuing to rise. So how can there be such a disparity between DEC, the government's own agency, and OBR? And then in terms of production, OBR again take the most pessimistic outlook of production. UK oil and gas suggest a 14% increase between now and that, or over that timescale. And yet OBR again suggests production you know, is, is, is going to remain low. Um, and finally, surely it's, surely it's taxing, taxing the imagination to suggest that, as OBR do, that we're not only seeing record investment now, but that's going to continue over the next several years. And yet all those investors who are making those crucial investment decisions are doing so on the basis that production is going to decline, prices are going to flatline. Surely that's stretching, stretching uh, credulity to make that suggestion. I think we've just heard the first of many new tax proposals from the SNP under independence, a tax on the imagination. Um, uh, uh, but but the, the, points, the, point, the, the questions are serious ones. I think the first thing I'd say is that um, the Office for Budget Responsibility was created precisely to have uh, an independent uh, objective forecaster uh, that is uh, independent of government, not influenced by government, that, that, um, that looks at uh, uh, all of the evidence from around the world and forms its own best judgment uh, about, about, um, about what it wants to, about, about, about the, the forecast that it puts forward. Um, and whilst um, economic forecasting is, uh, uh, is of course, it's, it's a forecast and therefore uh, things change, um, uh, what you've actually seen with the OBR's forecast of oil revenues over the past uh, two or three years is actually even their forecast has been significantly higher than the actual amount of revenue received from the, from the North Sea. And so I would urge the committee to bear that in mind. If you want to get into the uh, uh, get into the reasons for the OBR's forecast, you need to ask them. They're independent of government, so they would, uh, they would, need, to, they would need to explain to you for themselves precisely how they have built up uh, their forecasts. Uh, the, the whole point is to have uh, an economic forecasting uh, agency that, you know, I, I think under the previous regime, very often politicians were able to fix the forecast to suit their objectives, whereas... Me. No, 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 can I just finish answering it? Because there are about five questions in there. Um, uh, 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 whereas now we have an objective uh, independent uh, forecaster, which uh, recent evidence has shown even those forecasts have been higher than the amount of revenue actually extracted. That's why I think it is highly irresponsible for the Scottish Government to treat the OBR forecast as the lower bound and take much higher uh, and more optimistic forecasts. And then in terms of your 
questions about investment. Um, I, I, I've, I've, as I said, very warmly welcome the investment. I mean, I have been taking uh, uh, within the government decisions precisely aimed at increasing investment in the North Sea. But as I explained, many of those investments are off the back of additional tax allowances. Those tax allowances in and of themselves mean that we don't get as much revenue from those investments as we might have done for investments of a similar financial scale, uh, you know, decades ago. Um, and that's because the places that, that oil companies are now, sh are now exploring and innovating are, are, the, are the most difficult. You know, west of Shetland is much more costly to invest in than, than some of the, 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 the earlier places. The ultra-high pressure, high temperature investments that are, that are now coming forward thanks to the new cluster field allowance that we announced uh, in, the, uh, in the budget, again, those are very inaccessible, technically difficult reserves to get to. And it's only, again, because of tax allowances and the very nature of a tax allowance means you're getting less tax than you would be if that allowance didn't exist. Um, uh, but I think that's the right fiscal decision to take a hit on the tax side in order to enable the investment to go forward. Uh, briefly, Chick Brody. Yes, just, just if I may uh, follow on the, the question. Good morning, by the way. Uh, Good morning. The OBR forecast. Uh, you say that the OBR are independent of government. Of course, they're not, because, uh, as Alistair Darling said, the... Uh, you know, all that long ago, they're a wing of the Tory party. And in fact, the first chairman was an advisor to Mrs. Thatcher, Sir Alan Budd. Uh, the OBR itself, in talking about its processes, uh, says we consider our methodologies work in progress. So they're not fully reputable forecasts, are they? And one of the other things in terms of the forecasting is their oil for price forecast moves in line with the average of the futures curve and this is the last one, over the 10 working days to 27th of February 2014. Now, the OBR buys their forecasts from Bloomberg. Who's looked at their forecasts in the futures in the last month? Well, can I say firstly, I think that um, uh, the attack on the OBR is characteristic of an approach to this debate by Facts. SNP politicians no, who seek to besmirch the reputation of those, people, of those people who speak on this side of the way. I've seen the front page of the Daily Telegraph this morning with the most despicable attack uh, on, uh, on, an, on, an, on, an, on an individual. Um, and I hope very much that there'll be an explanation forthcoming for that behaviour from the Scottish Government. Um, so I think rather than trying to besmirch the independent Office of Budget Responsibility, which is completely independent that. of government, which is not um, a, a party political uh, organisation in any way, shape or form, I think that does lower the tone of the debate, if I may say so, Mr Brodie. And I'm sorry to have to say that to a former party colleague. Um, uh, but it is... Well, you um, alluded to that before, um, uh, Mr Alexander. Can I just put that to rest? As I say, some people choose to leave their party because of their principles. Some choose to leave their principles because of the party. Well, uh, your, your, your reasons are, are your own. I was trying to make a friendly point rather than an unfriendly one. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the OBR forecasts are based on the assessment of uh, the, uh, the Budget Responsibility Committee, which is combined of uh, uh, three economists of outstanding independent uh, reputation. Uh, they look at all the evidence that comes in based on the technical uh, assessment of their own uh, analysts uh, and come up with a forecast. As I say, if you want to question the basis of the OBR's forecasts, uh, I suggest that you put those questions to the uh, Office for Budget Responsibility. You're seeing it. All right, hold on, Mr. Brody. Please close your eyes. All right. Mr. Alexander. I, I, think I'd, I think I'd probably finished. Okay, thank you. Well, very briefly, Mr. Maxwell, yes. Thank, thank you, Kavina. Very briefly. I, you keep saying that we should ask the OBR, but you, you rely on the OBR figures all the time. You, repli you, you, you have spent the morning already talking about the OBR constantly. Um, could you give us an OBR forecast that actually proved to be correct? Well, I would say that uh, the OBR forecasts have been... I mean, the OBR has actually published uh, very detailed assessments of its own uh, about precisely looking at where the forecasts have been, uh, have been changed. I think if you look at the OBR's forecast for employment, for example... Uh, those forecasts have been pretty much bang on. Sorry, we're, um, we're, we're talking about oil and gas. Uh, uh, with you asked me for any OBR forecast that you, have been accurate. You were about, the questions are about oil and gas, uh, Mr Alexander. Name an oil and gas forecast by the OBR that's been correct. As I said, the, um, the, 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 in recent years, the uh, forecasts of the Office of Budget Responsibility have been about 20% above 
the actual amount of revenues so that has been so, so none that, of them have been correct that, that have been received. Uh, I think that then the answer is none, isn't it? I, I think that that should lead anybody who is looking objectively at the economic case for independence to pour serious doubt on the fiscal projections put forward by the Scottish Government because the Scottish Government figures aren't saying let's look at the OBR forecast, they've been 20% over optimistic, let's take a cautious projection so that we can offer a secure forecast. They're saying let's look at the OBR forecasts, which have proved to be a wee bit higher than the actual amount of revenue received. Let's double them, let's think of a number and double them and then say that's what will happen in an independent Scotland. It's total pie in the sky. So not, 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 not Mr. Maxwell, you've had your supplementary. Not we're going to uh, just, move on. Go to uh, yes, briefly, Mr. Kamai. Just really briefly. It is occasionally the business of government, the job of government, to prove <laughs> forecasters wrong. We get forecasts, and if the forecast highlights a problem, then the government should be taking action in order to uh, improve or, or to deliver a better outcome than that which is forecast. To, to try to undermine the credibility of a, a forecaster merely by a, pointing to a different outcome, I think rather misrepresents and misunderstands the whole purpose of forecasting. Okay, right, thank you. All right, okay, well, thank you, Mr. Maxwell. Okay, we'll need to move on, Mr. Biaggi. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Mr. Alexander, uh, in the event of a no vote, is the Barnett formula set in stone? Uh, as I've said uh, before, the Barnett formula is something which has not been um, uh, questioned or challenged by this government. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, uh, uh, the, there are uh, commitments to the Barnett formula from all uh, political parties. I think the main changes that are being proposed uh, are in respect of further devolution of tax raising powers, um, something that I strongly support. Obviously, uh, every time you devolve a tax raising power, as I think is happening in the Finance, I think my colleague David Gork is in the Finance Committee and almost in parallel with this uh, session talking about precisely this question. You have to have uh, ways of adjusting the, uh, uh, the, 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 the block grant. Um, so clearly that's a consequence of further devolution of, uh, of tax raising powers. Um, but uh, we were clear in the coalition agreement um, uh, that, uh, that there, are, there, are, there are no changes forecast, no changes uh, happening. Um, and I'm not aware of anyone who is uh, proposing in the next parliament or, or beyond to make um, uh, to, to, to get rid of the Barnett formula, except uh, those who argue for independence. Because, of course, if Scotland became independent, the, ba the, the Barnett formula... The current coalition agreement rules it out, but the current coalition agreement states that we recognise the concerns expressed by the Holtham Commission on the system of devolution funding. However, at this time, the priority must be to reduce the deficit and therefore any change to the system must await the stabilisation of the public finances. That's hardly ruling it out for all time to come. So the uh, issues raised by the Holton Commission, are, as, as the committee will know, um, the Holton Commission was established by the Welsh Assembly Government to look at uh, financing issues uh, in Wales. Um, the concern, there are two sets of concerns that they have it's raised. It's not so much the Holton Commission here as the coalition well, no, but I think responds it's, to it. The coalition well, I think paper it's, I think it's rather important. That you, you view it positively. I think it's rather important to explain the context mm -hmm. because the Holton Commission is looking specifically at Wales. Uh, there is a, a concern being expressed in Wales about uh, convergence of funding levels per head between Wales and, uh, and, and England. That's something that had been occurring up to sort of 2009, hasn't been occurring uh, for, uh, for a while. Uh, and it may very well be that, um, that, uh, uh, that the concerns of the Holton Commission about you know, con about convergence is something that uh, that could be looked at, but in the co that's in the context of the Barnett formula is something that could be looked that, at in terms of the no, recommendations. Uh, the the idea of uh, looking at the at the at the convergence in the context of the tax powers that are proposed for devolution to the Welsh Assembly, uh, uh, the Welsh Assembly government. That isn't about changing the Barnett formula uh, in any way. Uh, it is about um, uh, it is about uh, 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 looking at. The, uh, the overall financial position, including tax devolution uh, of the Welsh Assembly Government. As you know, um, the recent Silk Commission recommended uh, devolution of income tax powers to Wales uh, and indeed borrowing powers to Wales. Those, the income tax is subject uh, to a referendum in, in, in Wales and so uh, clearly if there were a referendum in Wales and they voted for devolution of income tax powers, um, then that would need to be taken into account. 
And it, it's important when these decisions are taken that there's, there's clarity about the, the consequences, um, whether that's the referendum in independence or the, indeed the, the referendum in Wales, and also the passage of the Scotland Act mm. here, where the command paper uh, for the Scotland Act 2012 set out one system of adjusting the block grant. And I believe currently your colleague is at the Finance Committee outlining that a different system is now proposed by the UK government which would include a change to the formula for generating Barnet consequentials. Now, is that the case? And if it is, is that something that has been agreed with the Scottish Government or is that something where there is no, no agreement? Um, well, I think it's not right to say that a particular method of adjusting the block grant was set out in the, uh, in the command paper. Um, I mean, it's probably best if my colleague David Gork answers these questions at the Finance Committee, given that that hearing is on those subjects. But there is, a, uh, there is, a, there is an ongoing... Oh, sorry, there, I, I, let I me do just have to say, I do have a quote from the command paper which sets out exactly what the formula well, was. What I was going to say is there is, an, there, is an, there is an ongoing discussion between the UK government and the Scottish government uh, about uh, what is the uh, fairest way of adjusting the block grant in respect of the devolution of different income tax powers. Um, and that's on the basis that you want to have a system of block grant adjustment that, is, that, that doesn't cause, in and of itself, um, an unfair gain or loss, either to Scotland uh, or to the rest of the United Kingdom. The whole purpose is to make sure that, with income tax devolution in particular, but also uh, uh, in, in, in other areas, but income tax devolution is the subject of the discussion But the, the fundamental here. issue here is that, is that in 2012, legislative consent was granted by the Scottish Parliament to this command paper's formula, whereas now we are in a position where there has been a departure from that agreement, and constitutionally there is nothing to stop the UK government going ahead with the approach that they propose, that you propose, because you remain the sovereign, sovereign body. So, No, there's been no departure from any agreement uh, there is a discussion going on about how technically you go about um, ensuring that the, that, the, that the system for block grant adjustment is one that is uh, carried out in a fair way that has no gain or loss to either, uh, to either government as a consequence of the nature of the adjustment. Um, there will uh, be no need for subsequent adjustments to the block grant to compensate for changes to these taxes after their devolution. That was the 2012 command paper current report is proposing ongoing adjustments to the Barnett formula as a result of those taxes. It, uh, it strikes me as very hard to reconcile those two positions. Uh, I, I, Mr. Convener, I don't have the command paper in front of me, but um, I think what's being offered is a, is a misleading interpretation uh, of what was said uh, at the time, uh, and I'm sure my colleague David Gork will be answering those questions in detail at the other committee. Okay, thank you. One last question. One last question. Yeah. Leaving the the intricacies of the 2012 Act aside, you said that no party is proposing to make any changes. The Campbell Commission, again, says that the UK should move to an independent, transparent, needs-based formula to serve all parts of the UK well. Recommendation 131 says the Liberal Democrats have long believed that the Barnett formula should be replaced by a genuine needs-based assessment. The 2010 Liberal Democrat Manifesto, which I believe you were the, the chair of the group that wrote, I was. also uh, expressed a, a desire to move away from the Barnett formula. How can you square those two statements? Uh, I would say that having spent a bit of time now in, in, the, in the Treasury actually operating the Barnett formula, looking at it, um, uh, I, I would say that, that uh, an adjustment that offers... Uh, so, uh, that offers sort of gains or losses to Scotland or to the rest of the UK is something that, um, uh, that, that, simply, isn't, that simply isn't practical or on the table. We made clear in the coalition agreement our, uh, our view of that. Uh, the discussion at the moment is one uh, about devolution of tax powers. Um, and as I say, uh, having, uh, having seen the Barnett formula in operation and, and been responsible for it, uh, I think it, it serves the interests of, um, uh, of Scotland and the rest of the UK well. Uh, and uh, what's more, of course, as the, as, the, as the Campbell Commission says, if you have substantial further devolution of tax-raising powers, which is what I would like to see and what my party would like to see, uh, then you have to make adjustments, significant adjustments, in order to, uh, to account for the revenue that's being raised directly rather than being allocated through, through a block grant. That process of adjustment um, 
uh, in respect of revenue raising powers would need to uh, would need to take place. Did you want to? Right. Um, Richard Baker. Uh, my first question is to um, Mr. Alexander. It reflects on your um, uh, discussion with Mr. McKenzie on the oil and gas issues. And as a member for the North East, you can imagine uh, I'm particularly concerned about employment uh, in the oil and gas industry in the longer term. So just to understand your position, you know, because the North Sea is a mature basin and the production costs are rising, your view is that whatever government or whatever context will need to decrease its tax take to ensure that the industry has a longer-term future. So we're looking more at you know, preserving employment rather than maintaining tax revenues in the longer term. I think that is exactly right. And it's actually, it's, it's actually precisely what is happening at the moment. Um, uh, that in order to, um, uh, to maximise the economic return from the UK continental shelf, um, uh, we've made a number of decisions uh, that are about, you know, through decommissioning relief, handing back tax revenue to the industry to help meet the cost of decommissioning through field allowances, sacrificing tax revenue in order to enable investments to go forward. That's precise, those are precisely the sorts of trade-offs that a responsible government should be making, precisely as you say, to maintain jobs and employment and investment uh, in the northeast of Scotland and indeed in other parts of Scotland that also uh, benefit from that industry. Thank you. My next question is on the issue of forecasts, which have also been discussed, and I don't think I've ever seen any forecast on oil and gas prices and revenue, which has been correct by anybody. But on the broader issue of forecasts, there's a lot that have been made. And I want to get your um, view on the forecast made by the Scottish Government in its outlook for Scotland's public finances and the Opportunities of Independence document, which was released at the same time you released your document um, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, that's making um, substantial assumptions in terms of economic uh, growth and growth in productivity as well. Now, how robust do you feel that the Scottish Government's uh, forecast were for, uh, for, for the economy post-separation? Um, I don't think they are robust at all. Um, if, you, if, you, um, if, you bear in, if, if you bear in mind that understanding those issues, some of the uh, consequences are of, uh, uh, of, of independence, particularly in terms of um, uh, uh, the border effect, where you create a new border that, that results in a very substantial diminution of trade. Um, if you think of the uh, uh, disruption that would be caused by a different currency system, you know, all of those things would undermine uh, trade and investment and, and growth. And it tends to be, not exclusively, it tends to be the traded sectors that are the more productive ones. Um, and so you take a hit to productivity there. Um, uh, the Scottish Government's forecasts were based on pretty heroic assumptions about, um, uh, about growth and productivity, uh, way above and beyond uh, anything that's been achieved in, 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 in similar regimes. I think that in order to uh, make their sums add up, um, they would need to see uh, uh, growth um, consistently one percentage point above the UK every year for about 40 years, um, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is um, I think, totally unrealistic. And um, it, it, I think that, I think in, in any set of circumstances where you're putting forward costings, you're, you're, you're trying to make a, a reasoned economic case, it is preferable to be cautious in your assumptions. And then if you're surprised on the upside, that's obviously welcome. Um, uh, I think that, that uh, coming up with the, the most optimistic set of numbers you can possibly ma imagine <laughs> Off the back of a fag packet, um, uh, and then uh, and, 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 and then saying that that's your central assumption for uh, for economic projections, um, uh, seems to me to be rather misleading. I've got to just finish last question yeah. by asking uh, both of you. I mean, there's a whole range of assumptions out there. The, the, the Scottish National Party attack, the OBR assessments, but we've also not had only the UK government's assessments. We've had assessments from the IFS about the economic challenges and in a separate Scotland. What's your view of the overall uh, range of assessments out there for the Scottish economy you know, if, if Scotland must become independent after September? Can I maybe just take a slightly different tack on that, Mr. Convener? I'm prompted by the fact that I know that Richard Baker uh, represents the, the, the North East of Scotland. Um, he'll know, as probably most of you do, that I was in practice as a solicitor in uh, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire before I was elected, and I was back recently uh, talking to people who had previously been clients, and uh, one of them was a, a fairly significant uh, commercial property developer in the northeast uh, of Scotland. 
Uh, now, this is not about how governments see forecasts. This is about how uh, fund managers see them. And uh, this particular commercial uh, property developer was telling me that he's now finding it very, very difficult to get financing for commercial property development in the northeast of Scotland. You know, one of the you know, best performing parts of, of the Scottish economy. Um, because of concern about the possibility of a yes vote in September. And what's happening, according to him, is that a, you know how commercial property development works. You, you, the developer uh, develops the property, they then sell it on, and that's where the, the fund managers come in. You have to have some certainty you're going to have that uh, on sale if you're going to get the finance for the, the development in the first place. And they were telling me that uh, you know that uh, level of, of uncertainty is now making it very very difficult for them to get access to finance. Now I'm quite happy to do what I can uh, to beat the drum for commercial property developers in the North East of Scotland or any other part, and I'll work with people in this committee or I'll work with people in the Scottish Government uh, if that is necessary. But in terms of of uh, forecasts and. Uh, who will look at forecasts and what the meaning of them is. Uh, I thought that was a very uh, illuminating uh, illustration. And I, I, when I just uh, emphasise here the offer of, of cooperation with the Scottish Government, uh, who I know are bound to be concerned about this, uh, and any member of the Scottish Parliament is, is an absolutely bona fide one. Can I just add a, a, just a two very brief points, Convener? Um, firstly, just one other feature of the Scottish Government's forecast, which um, may be of interest to the, uh, to the committee. Um, the, all these heroic assumptions about faster growth and rising productivity and so on, it's interesting to note that in order to make their numbers add up, they assume that none of the benefit of that feeds through to higher public spending. In other words, um, that, uh, that, that they make assumptions about the share of the economy that is spent by the state falling very dramatically uh, in Scotland over the period of their, uh, of their, of their fiscal forecast. That's the, it sort of backfills the black hole, if you like. Um, and so um, that may be something that you want to, you want to look at further. Um, the, 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 the second thing I'd say is that um, you can also look at what independent organisations have said about these, uh, about these forecasts. Um, the Economist magazine looked at um, uh, our report and, and others and said, Mr Alexander's figure is the higher of the two, but also the more credible. The Independent Institute for Fiscal Studies said the public finances challenges facing an independent Scotland would appear to face more substantial challenges in the UK. This re largely reflects the weaker initial position of Scotland's public finances and the likely long-run decline in revenues from oil and gas production, which would have a more significant effect on Scotland's fiscal position than that of the UK as a whole. This means Scotland would likely need to implement further tax increases and or spending cuts after 2016-17 to achieve a sustainable fiscal position above and beyond those required by the UK. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Alison Johnson. You convener. Um, good morning. Good morning. In your opening statements, you spoke about employment figures and, and how these were improving, but it remains the case that, that um, a third of the 13 million families in the UK in poverty are part of a working family, so that's not having the impact it should because of low wages, part-time employment increases, and you know, the fact that headline employment figures aren't telling us the whole story. So I'd be interested to learn what the UK government intends to <coughs> do about that under the current situation. And Mr Carmichael, you spoke about sharing the rewards um, and spreading the risks, but is it not the case that Scotland will be sharing increased energy prices as a result of the UK government's determination to, to invest in Hinkley Point? Experts in energy here in Scotland have pointed out that energy bills in Scotland and in an independent Scotland would actually decrease. We'll be paying more for the next 30 years. I'd be grateful for your comments on those questions. Right. Uh, I mean, first of all, on, on the question of uh, poverty and uh, you know, poverty within families and child poverty, um, you're absolutely right. There's an enormous uh, job of work to be done there. But let's not ignore the fact that that work is being done and that we are seeing remarkable progress. I mean, uh, the number of uh, children living in poverty is, is on a downward curve. 
We still have a 2020 target, which is very challenging. I've no doubt about that. But I'm, you know, I, I think it is uh, incumbent uh, on uh, us all to keep government's feet to the fire in relation to that. In terms of low wages, well, you are seeing, as I mentioned in my uh, opening comments, the uh, personal tax allowance uh, uh, rising now to £10,500 next year. I would hope that in the next Parliament, because that has been a direction of travel which has been pretty universally uh, welcomed and I think has been very successful uh, in helping people on, on low incomes in particular, we would go, be able to go beyond that. And uh, certainly I think my party at the next election will be wanting to promote that as a, a tool for taking us to a point where anybody on the minimum wage would be able to have a full-time job and not be paying income tax. Obviously, the manifesto is still to be written, but there's, uh, you know, that, that's very much the direction of travel that we would like to see us, us going in. Um, the minimum wage is, is being increased to £6.50, um, something which, uh, again, helps those who are uh, on low incomes. And uh, on the question of uh, energy prices, the, 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 uh, the overall energy policy here uh, is significant because uh, I think, I hope we have a, a shared commitment to uh, uh, increasing the amount of our uh, energy that comes from renewable resources. Candidly, though, I think we all know that that is going to require a fair level of public subsidy for quite some time to come. And uh, as part of that uh, public subsidy, the, 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 the subsidy is spread out over the market of the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, that's 63 million people compared to the 5 million people that we have in Scotland. And when we launched our own energy paper, we did outline the full range of uh, different uh, possibilities for extra costs to uh, energy bill payers in, in Scotland if you were to maintain similar levels of, uh, of, of subsidy for renewables. And I think from memory it went from about £30 to £180 a year. But is it not the case that we're seeing tax breaks for those who'd like to invest in hydro hydraulic fracturing and other unconventional gas extraction? Because we're being hamstrung, we can't invest in renewables in the way that we would want. And here's an industry in which Scotland has massive, massive potential. We're seeing far too many young people who are facing the option of, of low-paid employment, and we are being held back by the UK government's insistence in investing in outdated, outmoded technologies of the past. And, and on the issue of, of poverty and uh, you know, your, your wish to improve the situation for the many, why then, if things are so good, have Oxfam produced their Breadline Kids report this week? Why are we seeing increased numbers of people relying on food banks and other meal services? I'm just not convinced that the changes, the changes that you know that, that you're promoting are actually happening on the ground. They certainly aren't happening in my region. Well, look, um, I mean, I can only point you in the direction of the figures that show that we are still on a downward curve in terms of the number of children <coughs> living in, in relative poverty. Uh, you know, that's the progress that we've made to date. Um, I've told you already, I think there is an enormous amount still to be done in this regard. Um, I'm not going to hide from the fact that there is an enormous challenge here. Um, but we know that the best way of getting people out of poverty is getting them into work. Well, that and that in order to get uh, children in particular out of poverty, then there is a real role for getting parents into work. And in that respect, um, the uh, extra help that comes uh, from, uh, for, for, from the UK government for, for childcare is very significant. And as part of the change to universal credit, something in the region of 80 per cent of childcare costs will be made for people in universal credit. Could I just could add, a, add a couple of um, brief points to what, to what Alistair has said? Firstly, in terms of the uh, uh, framework for investment in renewable energy, 
uh, it is precisely because of the decisions that the UK government has taken in respect of the energy bill, the strike prices and so on, that we're seeing now substantial offshore wind investments in Scotland coming forward. I celebrate that. I'm sure every member of this committee does too. It will create jobs, particularly in the Highlands and Islands, but I'm sure in other parts of, uh, of, of Scotland uh, as well. That's happening with a system that incentivises investment in, uh, in renewable energy, paying considerably more per unit of electricity than would be paid for, for nuclear power or for other uh, other forms of, uh, of, 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 of investment. And those costs are spread across 30 million UK households, uh, as opposed to um, uh, across a, a, a significantly fewer number of households uh, in, in Scotland if those costs had to be purely met uh, by an independent Scotland. That's why our analysis paper on energy I think, gave a spread of, I think, between £38 and £189 in terms of the likely increase in, uh, in, in energy bills uh, under uh, independence. And I completely endorse everything that Alistair has said on, on, on child poverty. I just add that if you go back to the, uh, the, the fiscal arithmetic is also important here, because if a, uh, a, 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 I think we've demonstrated through the paper and through the discussion we've just had about oil revenues, that an independent Scotland would, have, would be in a position of having to make uh, either significant reductions in public expenditure or to raise taxes significantly simply to keep expenditure as it is at the moment. Uh, and so uh, in, 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 in that case, uh, the, the, the levers to tackle, I think what we all agree, um, is, a, is, a, is a huge, huge social challenge, would be, would be much less available uh, under independence than they are with the UK dividend that we have at the moment. Well, you, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, for example, they, um, they are reporting on the fact that we're going to lose all the increases. You know, we have moved some children out of poverty, but they certainly are very concerned that the progress we've made under devolution is being undermined by the welfare reforms that the UK government have put in place, welfare reforms that impact significantly on women and children. Um, and you spoke about spreading the costs with regards to energy prices, but I'd like to, if I may, convener, move on to the issues of pensions. This is another. This is your last question. This is another area in which we're constantly hearing how you know pensions are safer as part of the larger UK. But the fact is that pensions across the UK are a big issue. You know whether or not Scotland is independent or whether we're part of the UK, we need a culture change, the same sort of culture change that we need in banking and other issues. You know, ICAS have reported a significant, a significant underfunding issue across the UK. So do you not think it's better that we grasp the problem now, whether Scotland is independent or whether we remain part of the UK, and actually start funding our pensions properly and fully? Uh, and, I, you know, go, yeah. previous UK government okay. took a significant windfall out of pensions. Yeah, indeed, and uh, I was highly critical of them at, at the time and would remain so uh, today. Um, I, you know, I'm prepared to defend a lot of things, uh, but uh, the actions of previous Labour governments, I'm afraid, stretches uh, my... Uh, yes, <laughs> there are others who might have greater enthusiasm for that than me. Um, look, on the question uh, of welfare reform and child poverty, look, nobody has a, a monopoly of, of wisdom or, or solutions here. These are complex uh, and uh, wide-ranging um, problems. On the point of welfare reform, though, let's not forget that universal credit, it's estimated, is going to take something in the region of 300,000 children out of uh, child poverty. Um, on, uh, you know, look... This is what I mean about the, 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 the monop or the, nobody having the monopoly in wisdom. Look what uh, the UK government is doing in England uh, with relation to the pupil premium. I think this is obviously an area which is, is devolved to the control of the Scottish Parliament, and, and rightly so. But there are some really interesting, quite exciting and innovative uh, bits of work being done there uh, in relation to the pupil premium, targeting money at children who are in greatest need uh, and making a real difference to the lives of these children already. And, you know, it's not just a question about uh, child poverty because poor children, uh, we know, tend to grow up to be poor adults. And the way to, get, to break that cycle uh, is to improve their educational achievement. That's something that's happening already 
in relation to the uh, in relation to the pupil premium. You won't see the full benefit of that. You'll not see the full impact of that. Certainly not in this Parliament, perhaps not even by the end of the next one, but by the end of that one. But it's absolutely necessary that you do that sort of long-term planning and long-term thinking. I go back again to my own previous experience as, as a solicitor working in, in the criminal courts, uh, picking up clients who are 16, 17 years of age and who, frankly, had been beat before they got to primary school at the age of five. You know, these are difficult, very complex problems. Um, but targeted intervention on these children at the earliest possible stage uh, is, is what's going to turn their lives around. That's the sort of uh, action which we're taking, which I will be more than happy to uh, open the doors to, to share experience with, uh, with any member of this parliament or this committee who, who chooses to. Uh, on the question of pensions, uh, look, you're, uh, you're right to be critical of, of some of the decisions that have been taken in the past, uh, and we are having to struggle with the consequences of, of these decisions these days. Um, I would merely point you in the direction uh, of the changing demographic uh, that highlights the scale of the challenge that uh, would face Scotland. Um, at the moment, um, the figures are uh, that we have a, a slightly higher uh, percentage of uh, people receiving uh, pensions as opposed to the working age proportion uh, in part of the population. That is something which is projected to, uh, to, to grow uh, as we go ahead in, in the decades to come. Now, earlier warnings about projections uh, being, being uh, pertinent here, um, that would be a challenge that uh, an independent Scotland would have to meet. And it, it is a challenge which I would argue is be best met across the whole of the United Kingdom. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious we're more than halfway through our time and um, there's still quite a number of members to ask questions, so can I uh, ask for, for um, shorter questions and well, shorter answers? Yeah. It would be very helpful. Um, okay, Joan McAlpin, who I think is struggling to be heard, perhaps unusually. <laughs> it doesn't sound <laughs> unkind. Oh. Don't be unkind, Joan, but I hope you'll, you'll try your best. No, I hope you'll be here with me, convener. Um, <clears throat> And my question is for Mr. Alexander. Um, Mr. Alexander, two weeks ago, you brought out a briefing paper on the start-up costs of an independent Scotland, which you described as a comprehensive analysis. Uh, however, the professor at the LSE, whose figures that analysis was based on, Professor Dunleavy, said the figures were bizarrely inaccurate and seriously misleading. So perhaps could you explain to the committee why you published figures that were inaccurate and misleading? I hope the voice gets better. Um, and uh, the, I think the, uh, the sound system means you can be heard perfectly clearly by, uh, by, by everybody here. Um, the figures that, were, uh, that I published, uh, which are the ones in uh, this report that I mentioned earlier, um, are derived from uh, uh, work by Professor Young, who estimated that uh, the uh, setup cost of a new state um, would likely be around 1% of GDP. 1.5 billion pounds is 1% of, uh, of, 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 of GDP. Um, you can look at, uh, at, at other figures that might help to, to illuminate the detail of this. So, for example, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland recently published their assessment that to set up a new tax system uh, in an independent Scotland uh, would, uh, on its own, they thought cost £750 million. Uh, Mr Swinney, in his uh, secret memo to, the, to his Cabinet colleagues, uh, estimated the costs of a tax system in independent Scotland was between £575 million and £625 million. Um, In our own Scotland analysis paper uh, on, uh, on welfare issues, there was an estimate there just of the cost of, of an IT system, setting up the IT system for, for establishing a new... Uh, benefit and, and pension system in independent Scotland of around £400 million. So just those two things together take you to nearly £1.2 billion, uh, and that doesn't include all the other things that you would need to set up uh, uh, under, uh, under independence. Right. You um, quoted, excuse me, you, you quoted Professor Young, and Professor Young said 
that the 1.5 billion estimate was not his, but was rather extrapolated from the top of a range of estimates produced from an entirely separate work on Quebec. So you're you're standing by figures that Professor Young has already distanced himself from. Well, he didn't. Uh, he he came up with the estimate, the range of estimates of the cost as a share of GDP. Um, uh, we uh, took the range of estimates and applied them to the actual GDP. So that bit of maths was done uh, uh, based on his analysis, but as part of our uh, analytical work. But I think that, that as, as it were, the, the simplest way to resolve this problem would be for the Scottish Government, who I understand have been doing a considerable amount of work on this question, um, to come forward and publish uh, their own uh, detailed analysis. I think we saw the other day that there is a vast number of civil servants now being uh, 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 deployed somewhat presumptuously uh, in, um, in, 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 in working out how to uh, get a new state going in the event of a, of, a, of a yes vote. But I would really say, if you look at the ICAS assessment for the tax system, if you look at the DWP zone assessment for the cost of the IT system alone for a new benefit system, that already takes you to, uh, to, to 1.15 billion. Uh, so the 1.5 billion would assume that everything else costs 350 million pounds, less than the cost of this building. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, given that Mr. Swinney was asked 13 times what his assessment of the cost was and, and refused to, to, to answer, I, I really think that the onus is on the Scottish Government to be straight with people in Scotland about what the actual cost they think of setting up a new state could, were. Could you please answer my original question about Professor Dunleavy? Why did you use information? Uh, that he's described as inaccurate and misleading? You didn't answer that question. Well, I did answer it. I said, I explained that in the paper that I published, uh, the, 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 the estimates were that we used the 1.5 billion figure that we have. Uh, no, you is, put is, out a press uh, release using Professor Dunleavy's figures, which the, the, uh, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Sir Nicholas McPherson, has said that the Treasury misbriefed on that paper. Well, he's not the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, at least not yet. Permanent he's the Secretary Permanent Secretary, Secretary to the Treasury. He may, have, he may have higher aspirations. Yeah, um, my, my apologies, but the, um, <laughs> the substantive point is that he said that the Treasury had misbriefed. Why did you misbrief? Well, as I say, the figures in our paper are based on the estimates of, uh, of Professor Young. Um, uh, Professor Dunleavy's estimates were used to illustrate uh, what the costs uh, were in the UK context of establishing uh, new departments. I think it's quite interesting as well, Camina, to observe that um, of the £1,400 UK dividend, the money that each and every one of us in Scotland has um, uh, 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 as a consequence of being part of the United Kingdom, of the £1,400, only £4 derives from the setup costs. Now, uh, it's the only part of the, this analysis that's come under attack. So. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to agree with SNP members that the, the number is at least £1,396. Um, I, I think that there is some reason to believe that the £1.5 billion uh, is, is accurate or maybe even is an, is a, uh, is an underestimate, uh, given the ICAS and the DWP uh, 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 estimates. Um, but as I say, I, I find it extraordinary uh, that the Scottish Government is trying to sell the people of Scotland, the idea of creating a new state, but is not willing to name the price until after the vote has taken place. If I could go back, I, I would ask you one more time if you, if you could explain why the Treasury misbriefed and why you published misleading and ac an ac accurate account of Professor Dunleavy's research. As I say, what we've published is uh, what's in this uh, document, uh, which is drawn on the work of uh, Professor Young. Professor Dunleavy's figures Professor were used. Young's to, also distanced himself. Professor Dunleavy's figures were used to uh, to illustrate the costs uh, uh, historically, uh, department by uh, uh, by the de department. I think the substantive issue is what are the set up costs for a new state. As far as I'm concerned, the 1.5 billion pounds uh, is a reasonable is a is a reasonable uh, uh, is a reasonable estimate. Um, uh, it is frankly extraordinary that the Scottish Government have not yet been able to come up with any figures. I mean, uh, Mr Swinney's memo to his Cabinet colleagues, I think, was written two years ago. In that memo, it said that, that such work was taking place. Uh, I saw the evidence that the Deputy First Minister had given to the, uh, to the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, in which she made clear in her evidence that substan substantial work on these costs was going on and would be published. Um, uh, and I think the idea that this information is going to be concealed from the people of Scotland until after the referendum seems to me to be 
uh, to precisely illustrate to pe the people of this country uh, why the economic case for independence is not to be believed. Okay. Just perhaps add yep. to that. Briefly, yeah. Yeah. In fact, the undertaking given by the Deputy First Minister to the Foreign Affairs Committee was not just uh, to publish that work, but she said, and I have a transcript of the record here, um, we are doing a substantial piece of work in some of this just now. I'm not going to get into all the detail of this today because this is work we will publish in due course in the lead up to and in the white paper. But suffice to say, it covers not just running costs, but it covers the issues around setup. So, uh, on that uh, timetable, the information would appear to be a little overdue. Okay, we need to move on. Um, Chip Brody. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Convener, and good morning again. I think we've just heard a very selective rewriting of recent history. Um, I've got three very brief questions for uh, Mr. Carmichael, and uh, to avoid any intended obfuscation, a yes or no answer would be helpful. <laughs> uh, you... The first one is, when did I stop beating my wife? <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave personal matters to you, Mr. Camaro. <laughs> uh, you claimed that people, or campaign claimed that people in Scotland would be £1,400 better off mm -hmm. if they vote no. Uh, you then employed Engine Partners UK, run by a Better Together director, paying £30,000 to produce a patronising message using Lego figures depicting Scots as people who spend all their time eating hot dogs, fish and chips, pies, etc. Did you agree with that campaign? I don't believe that Engine did produce the BuzzFeed uh, graphic, if that's what you're, you're talking anyway, about. Do you agree with the, that campaign? I think you will find the dip. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry. My, my understanding was it, was it was produced by people in the Cabinet Office, but I might be, I might be wrong about that. I'm, I'm I'll, sure you will. Uh, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll concede Did you agree with the campaign? Um, sorry, did I agree? With the Lego campaign? It, what I mean is I've already been on the record of saying the Lego campaign or the, uh, the Lego BuzzFeed, uh, um, whatever it's called, I'm afraid. I'm not quite up to speed with all the technological innovations. But... Um, was intended as a humorous uh, means of getting across a serious message, which was, as the Chief Secretary has already outlined, uh, that as part of the United Kingdom, every person in Scotland is £1,400 better off. Um, I wouldn't, uh, I don't think it was just the most successful exercise in humour, but it's been withdrawn. Yeah, I must remember and tell my grandchildren next time they're playing with Lego, ask them what serious message they're giving me. The UK government spent £46,500 on attitudes in Scotland towards independence, which one presumes includes the economics of independence. Firstly, where is that taxpayer-funded report? Then secondly, VA research that we have now obtained from the House of Commons Library, we've discovered that since June 2013, the government of which you're a part, mm -hmm. has spent £140,000 on this research. That, including the £30,000 I just mentioned, is now £170,000. Will you publish the polls that have been a consequence of that research? Yes or no? I'm sorry, I don't recognise your 140000 figure, but you've obviously got a figure from the House of Commons uh, library yeah. that I've not uh, had been privy to, so I'm, no, I'm sorry, I can't comment on that. The polling work in, uh, to which you refer is routinely undertaken by government. Uh, it is not something which we have sought to publish in any way. You know the rules as well as I do, uh, Mr Brody, on, on the publication of polling information. If you publish any of it, you publish all of it. We've published none of it. We will continue to do so. That was, uh, that was work that was undertaken to inform government policy. £270,000 of taxpayers' money spent on unpublished po polling. Do you not think you're suggesting that we spent Do you not think you have a responsibility to the taxpayer? And I ask you again, will you publish the polls that have been a consequence of the £140,000 which are contained in, in documents in the House of Commons Library? Will you publish the polls? You're asking me to comment on figures that uh, I've not seen, so I'm not going to comment on figures that I haven't seen. I've told you already the position in the polling. Okay. Let, let's move away. We've had lots of numbers today. Let's talk about dem democracy as a Democrat. Uh, on the basis that, including the MPs and the law laws, people in Scotland elect just 4.1% of the UK Parliament. Let me just share something with you as a, uh, as a Democrat. I don't like the word devolution, uh, as, it, as we now know it has been called. 
That employs, implies power rests at Westminster from which centre some powers may be devolved. I'd rather begin by assuming that power should rest with the people who entrust it to their representatives to discharge the essential tasks of government. Now that we accept, and once we accept that Scotland is a nation, then we must accord it a parliament which has all, all the normal powers of government. Do you agree with that? I, don't, I share your, enthu uh, your, your lack of enthusiasm for the term devolution. Uh, and the term my that my uh, party has, has always preferred is, is home rule. And, uh, you know, we, I think we'd always see uh, devolution as being a step along the road towards home rule within a federal United Kingdom mm. because, uh, you know, people you like to, people like to uh, stick labels on you mm. in this debate and you get labelled as a unionist. I've always seen myself as being a federalist, as mm. doubtless you, you did yourself at, at one point. Um, the point, though, about uh, sovereignty is, is a very interesting one. Um, because that was the basis on which the Constitutional Convention proceeded uh, throughout the 1990s. And it was that sovereignty in Scotland uh, is vested in the people, not the sort of classic dicey definition that par Parliament uh, is, is, as a okay. body, sovereign. Okay. Uh, I would still uh, hold to that uh, view of sovereignty right. today. But it is, and that is why it is perfectly proper and legitimate that we should have within Scotland a referendum on where we see our best constitutional future. As a Scot, I will exercise my sovereignty to say that I would wish us to remain part of the United Kingdom. You see, that statement I read uh, uh, in the last part, once we accept that Scotland is a nation, then we must accord it a parliament which has all, all the normal powers of government, was written in a document called a personal manifesto by the father of modern liberalism, your predecessor in Auckland Shetland, Joe Grimmond. I would have thought that given the great work that he did, particularly in the parts which you currently represent, that uh, you might have agreed with that statement. Surely you're not, no further, you're not suggesting, surely, Mr Brodie, that Joe Grimmond was ever in favour of independence. I'm quoting his statement from, person, you, from his personal not, manifesto. You're, you're not telling me. You're not suggesting surely. I'm quoting from his personal I mean, manifesto. Were, I don't know if it was yourself, or, or I think it maybe was yourself, that said that you just heard a rewriting of history. If you're trying to claim Joe Grimmond as somebody who's in favour of independence, uh, then in terms of rewriting history, right. I bow at the feet of the master. Right. Well, can, can and, I just, can I just, and that's perfectly acceptable, but I suggest I you go and buy I, a personal manifesto. Okay, okay, thank you. Can, can I just yeah. add, add two, two very uh, uh, brief points? I mean, I think the fundamental difference between liberalism and nationalism is liberalism seeks to break down barriers between peoples and nationalism seeks to build up a new barrier in this case. Um, and I think that the, the exchange we've heard illustrates that perfectly. Secondly, if you're going to quote statistics, well, Scotland has 10% of members of the House of Commons, just under. Uh, the logic of your argument would suggest that because Scotland only has 0.8% of the members of the European Parliament, that somehow we should withdraw from the uh, European Union. Yet I personally believe very strongly that we are, as Scots, stronger and more powerful and more effective and more prosperous not just as part of the United Kingdom, but also as part of the European Union. That's the whole, the whole purpose, is to, to share sovereignty for the wider uh, benefit and to use that uh, to our advantage as, as, as the people of Scotland. See, fortunately, Mr. Alexander, I just made... I've had experience of both liberalism and nationalism, and I'm happy for you to bow at the feet of the Master also. OK, perhaps we should move on. Um, if I ever encounter him, I will do so. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, Margaret McDougall. Gentlemen, um, in your introductory remarks, um, the Right Honourable uh, Alistair Carmichael, uh, you mentioned you mentioned the triple lock pensions, and uh, we hear from the, the SNP that they probably won't increase the retirement age. Mm -hmm. How feasible is that, and what are the implications of that for an independent Please Scotland please. and indeed the, because of the ageing mm -hmm. population which you touched on earlier? Well, I mean, there is what uh, accountants and actuaries call the dependency ratio, which is the ratio of people who are in employment to those who are uh, of, of retirement age. And 
Uh, I think at one point, uh, in fact, the Scottish Government uh, tried to pretend that that was a better position in Scotland than it is in the rest of the United Kingdom. But in order to do so, uh, they included children in the calculation. I don't think most people would see children uh, as being of working age. Now, the benefit of the triple lock is that it uh, guarantees the state pension to go up uh, by uh, the rate of uh, inflation, by average earnings, or 2.5%. Um, and that is, you know, that has been that has delivered the single largest increase in the state pension ever in, in the course of this Parliament, uh, and that is a very tangible benefit that has come to older people in, in Scotland uh, as a result of a uh, of the coalition uh, and policies, and, and it, you know it was a very uh, deliberate and not uh, a, an easy decision that we, we had to take because, of course, money spent in the state pension is money that's not available for people in uh, in, in uh, the rest of the uh, the rest of the welfare system. So, how can feasible is it? One, Sorry. one brief thing to that: um, the specific facts are that not increasing the state pension to 67 would cost around six billion pounds in Scotland. Uh, between 2026-27 and 2035-36. And an extra cost. In extra pension costs, uh, and would result in about £9 billion of lost GDP in that same period. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it, as, as well as the, the broader points yeah. that Alistair yeah. rightly makes yeah. about the demographic challenges yeah. being more challenging in Scotland than in the rest of the UK, there is a precise financial loss that would, that, that would have to be found within the public finances of an independent Scotland were that policy to be followed through. Mm -hmm. And what are the likely ways of, of funding that in an independent Now, so you either put taxes well, up or you cut spending on other things. Yeah. The, the lesson that we've surely learned in the last 10 years is that you can only spend the money once. So, are we facing then, if we become an independent Scotland, uh, increases in taxation? Well, we're facing some very, very difficult choices. Um, uh, Danny's already explained at some length the fiscal position that we'd be facing Scotland from the year 2016-17 onwards. Um, the truth of the matter is that as part of the United Kingdom, we still face challenges. You know, I'm part of a campaign that's called Better Together. It's not called Perfect Together. There are always going to be challenges, but I would argue, and I hope you might agree, that, in fact, these challenges are base mate as part of, of a United Kingdom, albeit one which includes within it a, a strong Scottish Parliament for which more power should be coming. Mm -hmm. um, but in an independent Scotland, are we likely to see uh, I would say, greater increases? again, um, as part of this, the analysis paper where we set out the scale of the, uh, of the UK dividend, um, uh, this is purely illustrative. If you're going to uh, balance the books uh, in an independent uh, Scotland, in other words, to, uh, to, to, to maintain levels of public spending without, with, um, then uh, uh, rather than have cuts, then all onshore tax revenues would need to be increased uh, by 13% from the start of independence. For illustrative purposes, this would be equivalent to a basic rate of income tax of 28%, a 26% rate of VAT. Uh, and increasing the main duties on alcohol, tobacco, fuel, and vehicles, etc., by almost 40%. So those are the uh, those are the sorts of things that you would have to do in order to fill the gap uh, in the finances. And, and by definition, part of the UK dividend is that we can have public expenditure uh, and the services that we rely on and money to support those public services without having to make those sorts of decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I'm disappointed at the, the double speak that we heard earlier on this morning about the Barnet formula. You seem to be wavering all over the place. Um, I'm interested to hear that you, 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 still, you, you still accept responsibility for the outrageous exaggeration of, of two weeks ago on the start-up cost for independence. Um, and, of course, you sold out on tuition fees. Why should anybody in Scotland believe anything that Liberal Democrats have to say on any of these matters? Um, because we have delivered for Scotland a growing economy, cleared up much of the mess that was left to us by the, uh, by the previous uh, government. We've seen Alistair highlighted them at the start of his presentation. 
uh, further su substantial increases in employment in Scotland and across the whole of the UK, showing the plan for the, for the economy that wouldn't be happening without Liberal Democrats in government is working uh, for Scotland. We've delivered substantial cuts in income tax, uh, delivered, over-delivered actually on our promise of an income tax personal allowance increasing to £10,000. Uh, That's a tax cut worth £700 for every single Scot. We've delivered on our promises, and I mentioned earlier, in relation to investment in uh, North Sea uh, oil and gas. We've delivered on our promises, as I said earlier, uh, in respect of the previous question, in terms of investment in renewable energy, the framework that my colleague Ed Davey has put in place. We've delivered on our promises of a, of a triple lock for pensions, delivered by a Liberal Democrat pensions minister, Steve Webb. We've delivered on our promises uh, in terms of the Calman Commission, in terms of further devolution. We've passed that legislation, income tax devolution uh, and, and other things are coming. Uh, you will all be paying, we will all be paying uh, a Scottish rate of income tax from 2016 uh, onwards. I'd like to see that, uh, that go further. Of course, as the minority party in a coalition government, you cannot deliver 100% of your manifesto. Uh, but I think delivering about 70%, as one study showed, uh, is, 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 a, is a good record and certainly one that I am very proud of. In respect of the arguments that we're making uh, here, for example, in this document, uh, I read out, I'm happy to read them into the record again, but I won't, Mr. Convener, for, for, for reasons of time, um, the huge variety of independent economic assessments that back up our claim. I think one of, the, the, one of the most interesting features of the debate on the economics of independence over the past few weeks is that uh, we have not found a single uh, economic commentator who's coming out and backing the argument that Scotland will be substantially better off under independence. There may be many other reasons to argue for independence. But the economic case is not one that stacks up okay. at all. Okay, that, 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 that was an interesting exchange. This is not an inquiry into the uh, credibility or otherwise of the Liberal Democrat Party. So perhaps Mr. McKenzie. I was asked the question, so I felt I had to answer it, Convener. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. Maybe, maybe one day we'll have an inquiry on that subject. But that, <laughs> today is not that day. Today we're looking at Scotland's economic future. So perhaps Mr McKenzie could ask a question relevant to that. Thank you, but I'm sure you'll agree with me, Convener, that credibility is everything in these arguments. And um, the, I'm mindful of the recent result of the European elections uh, and, and confident that an awful lot of people share my views rather than the gentleman in front of the committee. So, um, Mr Alexander, uh, when you last were here in front of the committee, only minutes ago, according to um, your recollection, you offered to write to the committee and share the UK government analysis of and downside costs <coughs> of not, not uh, continuing in a currency union with Scotland. And, and you did indeed write to the committee, but you didn't provide any of that information that I asked for. Can I take from that that no such analysis has been done? I thought I had provided all of the, uh, um, the, the figures that you had asked for. Um, uh, I thought that um, in paragraph 7 of my letter, I answered precisely the question that I've been asked at the committee. But if the committee, through the clerk, um, feels that my reply was inadequate, then I'd happily um, uh, examine it if there are further issues that the committee would like me to write on. Uh, I felt quite oh, just apparently I'm, I'm that, sure, that, that, I'm by, sure. that, by, that by offering the figures about the transaction costs, which is the pre precise thing that you'd asked me about, um, uh, uh, that I was fulfilling my commitment. I, I'm sorry if you feel that I haven't, and I'd gladly look at the letter again. Just, just remind me, what were those tra transaction costs for the UK businesses uh, or remaining UK businesses exporting into Scotland after independence if we don't share the, a currency union? Um, what, what, what were those costs? Uh, I'm just looking at my, my letter here, convener. Um, uh, um, I, I'm actually not the convener, but surely you have those, finger, no, those figures at your fingertips. Uh, I don't have those facts at my fingertips. Um, but the transaction costs oh. 500 million for um, Scottish firms and 600 million for UK firms. But then you disagree with Professor Muscatelli, who said that those costs could be 2.5 billion. Um, I think that in coming up with those figures, we used the same methodology that the Scottish Government had used. Um, uh, and so, if that, I haven't read Professor Muscatelli's evidence, but if those are the figures that he gave, they're clearly different to the ones that, uh, that we have had to offer. I think the more substantive point, though, is that in considering a currency union, uh, as the committee will know, um, uh, you need to consider issues much wider than transaction costs. If transaction costs were the only thing that mattered, 
it would be more in the interests of the rest of the United Kingdom to enter into a currency union with the Eurozone, accommodating 40% of trade, as opposed to, to Scotland, which would be an independent zone of about 10% uh, of the rest of the UK's trade. It would even, even be more in the interests of the rest of the UK, purely on the basis of transaction costs, to enter into a currency union with the United States of America at 20% of UK trade, as opposed to Scotland at 10%. The, the, the problems with a currency union go way, way beyond um, transaction costs uh, uh, and indeed the costs of a currency union in terms of uh, lack of economic flexibility for an independent Scotland where the paths of economies would diverge substantially uh, and the substantially increased for, risk for, for the rest me, of the UK. For, forgive uh, me, those Mr. Are substantive issues. we're a wee bit short of time and you're going beyond the scope of my question. Um, can, you tell me, can you tell me what that analysis suggests about the cost to the UK and the difficulty the remaining UK would have in terms of its balance of trade deficit? Um, I think the balance of trade deficit argument is a bit of a red herring, actually. Um, uh, there's no particular evidence that, that, uh, uh, that, the, that the currency argument has much of an impact one way or another uh, on the balance of trade. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the issue is uh, the issue facing the rest of the United Kingdom uh, as is borne out by the analysis from a whole variety of independent sources in, 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 in recent weeks, is that of taking substantial risks with, uh, with the, the UK economy. We've seen the way that those risks get transmitted between countries can, can in we the just Eurozone. Can confine and I ourselves I, to the balance of trade question? I'm, I'm really shocked and surprised to hear you suggest that that's not important. Isn't it the case that the UK balance of trade deficit would double without the benefit of Scotland's exports? Uh, no, I don't think it is. Um, well, uh, but I don't have that information immediately to hand. Well, I'm disappointed, was, uh, Chief Secretary, to the Maybe Treasury. Mr Barrington could, could um, in the closing uh, minutes, play a starring role. Perhaps I could add, there, were, there was analysis by the credit rating agency Fitch, which estimated that the um, effect of independence on the UK's balance of payments would be marginal. That's consistent with the analysis that was produced by Professor Brian Ashcroft uh, several months ago. It's also worth saying that Fitch, as part of that analysis, then went on to state that if the UK were to join a currency union, that would be negative for the UK's credit rating. So can you give me just the value of uh, Scotland's exports in terms of the significant impact that they do have on the, on, in, 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 uh, the UK balance of trade deficit? No, we Surely don't. have those facts at I, your fingertips. I don't have those, those figures to hand, but as I say, my view, and obviously the view of Fitch as well, is that uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is a negligible uh, argument. <coughs> So you don't agree with me that this matter is really quite important and important for the UK government to consider as well as the Scottish government? No. I don't it's agree. not important. Thank I don't, you. I don't agree with you. Okay. I mean, I'm sure there are things we do agree about, but we haven't identified yeah. any today. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Lastly, Stuart Maxwell. Uh, uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, before we move on to the questions I was going to ask, I want to just clear up something about the Barnett formula. Um, two weeks ago, uh, Mr Alexander, you said in, a, in response to a question to Brian Taylor, of the BBC, I am not aware of anyone who is proposing to get rid of the Barnett formula. You, replete, you repeated that uh, statement this morning in response to questions from Marco Biaggi. Yet uh, the Campbell Commission, your own parties, look at the uh, uh, future of constitution, said the Liberal Democrats have long believed that the Barnett formula should be replaced. How can you reconcile those two statements? Uh, I think I did very clearly in response to Mr Biaggi's questions earlier. I don't have anything particular to add to the answer I gave then. No, no, you've said... It's the same question, so I've... No, no, I've, uh, but you, you have, didn't answer the question. I did. You said no party is proposing to scrap the Barnett formula. Your uh, own point, party the, is the, proposing the to scrap I, the, the Barnett formula. The point I made in response to the, uh, to the earlier question is that um, uh, as you go about the process of devolving further tax powers, we're, we're having this debate at the moment, Mr Biaggi referred to it, in the context of um, uh, uh, the, 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 the Calman Commission proposals in the Scotland Act 2011 or 12. Uh, 2012, uh, that you have to make adjustments to the block grant and adjustments to the way that works in order to account for the, uh, the, 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 the revenues. But I also made clear that, that as, as the coalition agreement says, um, uh, there's no change to the Barnett formula uh, on, the, uh, on the horizon. And as the minister who's been responsible for public expenditure for the last uh, four years and, and operating the Barnett formula, in my view, um, subject to the adjustments that need to be made when, um, when, when tax powers are uh, are devolved, um, it, it works well. 
So, uh, your position now is that uh, you support adjustments to the Barnett formula in line with the, any changes that would take place. Uh, the Liberal Democrats' position, uh, as outlined by the Campbell Commission, is the Barnett formula should be replaced, should be scrapped. Not adjusted, but should be scrapped. So you reject the Campbell Commission and Liberal Democrat position on this? As I say, um, I, 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 I mean, I can repeat the same answer again uh, several times, if you like, convener, but um, I think well, I've, I've, I think I've, answered the question. I think I've given the answer the to, the, to the question several times. Okay. I'm just trying to get an answer, convener, to the direct question, which is if whether, you, whether Mr Alexander agrees with the Liberal Democrat position as outlined the Campbell Commission about replacing the Barnett formula. As he's now saying, you're not replacing it, you're going to adjust it. As I say, the context is um, about further substantial further devolution of, of, uh, of tax powers, which I strongly support. Um, that requires precisely as we're, the process that we're going through at the moment in the context of the Scotland Act 2012, uh, which is to uh, make adjustments in the light of, uh, of, of, of devolution. The position that's set out in the coalition agreement on that is, is, uh, is abundantly clear. Okay. So, so you, you, effectively, the Campbell Commission recommendations are dead. That you don't, they don't agree with them. Quite the reverse. The, the recommendations of the Campbell Commission, in terms of substantial further powers on income tax, in terms of devolution of things like on inheritance tax, formula, capital gains tax, and so on, on the it, formula, is, it is. I think far from being dead, those 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 proposals are uh, uh, not just alive, but um, but but very much. Uh, uh, part of the debate now because we've seen from both Conservative and Labour parties also uh, 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 detailed proposals for further devolution. I think the one thing that people can be certain of uh, is that if Scotland remains part of the United Kingdom, there is very substantial uh, further uh, tax powers coming to this Parliament, quite rightly so too, uh, and that just reinforces the argument that as part of the United Kingdom we have the best of both worlds. I'll, I'll move on, convener, because uh, it's, clear, it's clear that Mr Azan does not support his own uh, Campbell Commission uh, report and recommendation on the Barnett formula. Um, you said on the 30th of May, Mr Alexander, that flights from Inverness are APD free. Um, the HMRC website states, and I want to quote it exactly, passengers carried on flights from other areas of the UK to airports in this region, meaning Inverness, are chargeable passengers and subject to APD at the appropriate rate. Which of those is correct? Well, I think the, uh, the, 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 the thing that Mr Maxwell should have in mind is the difference between the meaning of the words from and to. Uh, all, mm. um, uh, all flights departing from airports in the Highlands and Islands are APD free. Flights that do not depart from airports in the Highlands and Islands are subject to air passenger duty. Yeah, you, you, you have said this several times. Do you not accept that effectively you are misleading people in an attempt to try and pretend that there is no APD uh, in and out of the Highlands uh, by continually... Uh, I mean, your latest one was a tweet about uh, Inverness being APD free, and yet we all know that effectively if you want to encourage uh, trade into an area, or if you want to encourage visitors, for example, for tourists from the south of England to come to uh, your area in Inverness Shire, then clearly uh, you know, they have to pay APD. Uh, uh, all flights that depart from airports in the Highlands and Islands are APD free. So All flights so into the Highlands and Islands, you have to pay APD. That's right. And so uh, if you are, for example, flying from Inverness to London, uh, you pay no APD on the flight from Inverness and you pay APD on the flight to Inverness. My understanding is that the unfunded proposal in the White Paper, uh, one of many unfunded proposals in the White Paper, another black hole in the, in the Finance of Independence, suggests having APD. Uh, so even on that basis, uh, you pay uh, half the APD on a return journey to Inverness than you do... Uh, to, to other, uh, uh, when you're flying outside the Highlands and Islands, of course, if you're flying from Inverness to Stornoway uh, and back again, you pay no APD at all uh, on that leg, or indeed from from Orkney and Shetland to to, 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 to Inverness, um, you pay no APD uh, on on either leg. I'd also add, uh, Mr. Fraser, uh, uh, sorry, convener, um, uh, that uh, we've also set out a, a significant investment in a regional air connectivity fund, and I was delighted. Uh, at the end of last week to be able to support the first uh, public service obligation under that uh, fund, which um, is between so to support the route between Dundee uh, and London Stansted, which is a vital economic connection, I think again shows uh, the UK government stepping in to support what are important transport links. I, I just wish that the Scottish government would do the same with regard to the A9. Oh, dear, dear. I mean, uh, effectively, uh, of course, tourists coming to uh, uh, the Highlands of Scotland do pay air passenger duty. Um, the industry itself, uh, whether it be the head of uh, uh, British Airways or Ryanair or Flybe or, or many others, including airport managers, have said that APD is uh, extremely damaging to the, the aviation industry. 
Um, do you agree with that? Well, I'd say that if the Scottish National Party was truly concerned about the flow of people in and out of the Highlands and Islands... No, I'm asking they, they what, you, would, I'm asking they, what they, your no, view no, is. You're asking, your you're view. asking about, uh, your about tourists coming in to no, the Highlands and Islands. No, I'm asking what your view is. Whether you uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just about to explain it, if I may, Convener. Uh, my view is that if you were really concerned about that issue, you would not be imposing average speed cameras... Uh, on the uh, on the A9, I don't which think is, that affects flights, which is, Mr. Alexander. Which is disruptive to the economy. It is opposed by uh, business organisations uh, in the Highlands. It won't make the route uh, safer, um, uh, and it just goes to show once again uh, that the, uh, the the current Scottish government uh, is less interested in the economy of the Highlands and Islands than I think any government that we've seen for quite That's some time. Rubbish. Well, I think that uh, I do have one more question, but it's clear that Mr. Alexander has struggles to understand that uh, uh, you know average speed cameras don't affect flights. Uh, but can I ask, the Strathclyde Commission and the I'm Canberra sorry. Commission both, both state that APD should be devolved. Uh, and uh, they go on to say that there is no need, and I'll quote the Strathclyde Commission here, there is no need for fresh legislation. In that case, why will you not promise now, today, to act and devolve APD now, since no fresh legislation is required, before the referendum? I mean, that's something that, that uh, was considered in res response to the uh, Calman Commission, which clearly need to be considered uh, in response to uh, the various uh, proposals that are, uh, that are on the table. Um, clearly, that can only be uh, taken forward in, in the event that Scotland, as I very much hope it will, votes to remain part of the United Kingdom. No, no. It, you, you, your own commissions have said you don't require any legislation, and, yet, and you all say that you will devolve APD. Why not just go ahead and do it now? Well, the Strathclyde Commission is not my own commission. That's the Conservative Party's commission. And the Campbell Commission, commission supports the de devolution of APD. That is your own commission. Yes, it is. So uh, why uh, don't you do it now? And as, well, as I say, that's something that, that, um, that would need to be uh, considered to be taken forward under any well, no, uh, further, further devolution. Okay, I think you've asked your question, Mr. Maxwell. Thank you. Okay, um, we are uh, out of time, I'm afraid. Um, it's been a, a lengthy session and we've covered a lot of ground. I'm grateful to you all uh, for coming along and answering our questions. We will now suspend until 11.20.
Right, if we can uh, reconvene. Uh, panel two uh, this morning uh, on our inquiry into Scotland's economic future post-2014. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Nicola Sturgeon, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities, uh, John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth, and Dr Gary Gillespie, Chief Economist, Office of the Chief Economic Advisor at the Scottish Government. Welcome to you all. Um, we have about uh, 90 minutes uh, this morning, which I hope will be enough time to cover the topics of interest to the committee. But I would remind members that they would to keep their questions uh, short and to the point, and if we could have responses as short and to the point as possible, that would be very helpful in terms of getting through the topics in the time available uh, to us. Uh, I wonder if I could just start off by asking yourself, uh, Deputy First Minister, um, if you could set out for us, maybe in, in two or three minutes, why you think Scotland's economy would benefit from a yes vote in the referendum in September. Uh Thank you, Convener. I'm very happy to do that. Before I do so, can I thank the committee for giving uh, John Swinney and I the opportunity to come back here today to uh, give evidence at the end of your inquiry, just as we gave evidence at the start of the inquiry. I think all of us have enjoyed following uh, the evidence during the course of the inquiry, and uh, we'll look forward very much to your report. Um, my uh, strong uh, belief and uh, strong position is that a yes vote leading to Scotland becoming an independent country will be good for Scotland, and in particular will be good for for our economy. Uh, it will give Scotland control over the decision-making levers that determine the success and prosperity uh, of any economy. Um, it will enable us to design an economic policy that is right for our needs and circumstances. The starting point uh, for us in this debate, I hope the starting point for everybody in this debate, regardless of uh, what side anyone is on, is that Scotland is a rich country, uh, an extremely wealthy country, blessed with extraordinary resources both human resources and natural resources. Uh, an independent Scotland would, uh, per head of population, be the 14th richest country in the OECD, uh, generating wealth uh, per head of population higher than Japan, than France, than the UK itself, indeed than the vast majority of independent countries. We've got a strong and diverse economy. Uh, as Standard & Poor's said recently, even excluding North Sea oil and gas revenues, an independent Scotland would qualify for their highest economic assessment. Uh, the projections uh, we published two weeks ago on Scotland's public finances show that uh, fiscally we would begin life as an independent Scotland uh, in at worst, roughly the same, uh, at best, slightly better position than the UK. So we can be independent because we have that enormous starting point as an independent uh, country. The real arguments for independence, though, are what it enables you to do. It's about the control over policy levers that I spoke about, uh, allowing us to design an economic policy that addresses our challenges. An independent Scotland, like all countries, will face challenges. It's important to address those challenges and to maximise the opportunity. So control over uh, economic policy, control over uh, levers such as immigration policy, giving ourselves uh, control of both sides of our balance sheet, spending and revenues to allow us to, for example, transform childcare will allow us uh, to grow our economy more sustainably, to grow our working age population, to increase uh, the participation in the labour market and in the paper we published uh, just two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, we set out some of the opportunities for the Scottish economy over the medium to long term if by using uh, those levers uh, to best advantage we are able to achieve uh, those aims. So independence is all about opportunity, it's about putting yourself uh, in the driving seat of the decisions that shape any uh, country and I believe it would be uh, incredibly uh, good for Scotland and good for the Scottish economy. Thank you very much. Um, you raised a number of uh, subjects there I'm sure we want to explore in the, in the questioning uh, this uh, morning. Mr Swinney, do you want to add anything? Mr. Yeah, you want to do that, yeah. Okay. C can I um, move on to a topic that you mentioned, um, Deputy First Minister, and which came up this morning. I don't know if you saw the earlier evidence session well, we had it, with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury. But, but one of the issues he raised was in relation to uh, Scotland's uh, public finances and the outlook, and you mentioned the paper published uh, last week, and specifically on this question of the North Sea oil uh, tax receipts. Uh, and it says in, in, in your paper uh, published last week uh, that you project that these will be um, under your preferred scenario, scenario four, uh, in 2016-17 it would be 6.9 billion, uh, in 2017-18 7.3 billion, and in 2018-19 6 billion. That's all on 
uh, page uh, 26 of the, of the analysis. La last week, um, Professor Andrew Hughes Hallett, who you'll be no will be known to you as a, a member of the Scottish Government's Council of Economic Advisers and also a member of the, the Fiscal Commission, and I understand he may actually have been the author of the Fiscal Commission report. Uh, Professor Hughes Hallett appeared at the Finance Committee and told the, the Finance Committee that uh, the uh, revenues from oil for those years would be between 4.5 and 5.5 billion, substantially below the figures quoted in your own document. Who, who is right here? Well, I mean, I've looked, uh, as you would have expected me to do, at the evidence of Andrew Hughes Hallett and indeed uh, all of the evidence that's been uh, submitted both in written form and orally to the committee. And you know, I think it's also important to point out that Andrew Hughes Hallett said in his written evidence, I make no attempt to provide forecasts of North Sea oil and gas revenues. And before the committee itself, he said, the particular number comes from the change, not the levels. Uh, it's not a forecast. It's a reason why it might change. And he talked about a central projection with one or two each side. Now, you know, I think it's important to take the comments of Andrew Hughes Hallett in that wider context. In terms of the projections that the Scottish Government has set out, and you know, the projections are there for scrutiny by this committee and by any member of the, the Scottish uh, population, uh, those projections are based on some key forecast assumptions, and it's those assumptions that lead us to uh, scenario four, as you say. Uh, firstly, that the oil price remains constant at $110 in cash terms, and it's important to point out uh, that that uh, projection in terms of the price of, of oil would constitute by 2018-19 actually a 10% reduction in the price of a barrel of oil by about 10%. Uh, prices are currently at $110. Uh, that's been the average uh, oil price between, uh, I think, March 2012 and March uh, this year. And, you know, the reason I say it's a a sensible and cautious estimate is because I can point to you know, a DEC estimate that projects at $128 a barrel in 2018. So we're taking a cautious estimate there uh, on price. And it's also uh, a projection that's based on uh, an assumption that says production and investment will be in line with industry expectations. So you know, we are uh, being, uh, I think, responsible. Uh, we're being uh, cautious. Uh, but we're also perhaps sometimes unlike our opponents on the other side of uh, this debate. Uh, being uh, sensible about the massive contribution that North Sea Oil and Gas makes and setting out a clear objective to steward that resource properly. Okay, thank you. I mean, I read Professor Hughes Hallett's evidence to the Finance Committee and I read the transcript, in fact, I have a copy of the transcript here from the evidence he gave. And he was asked specifically by my colleague Gavin Brown uh, if he was being reasonable in his estimation, and, and he agreed with that. He said, yes, it is reasonable. Um, to, uh, to come forward with these figures. And he said, if I was lucky to be running the budget, I would have that perhaps as a central cost in one or two on each side. But it sounds like you're disagreeing quite substantially with his figures. And his figures are 4.3 billion over three years lower than the figures you're basing your estimates on. I think if you look, Vina, at the, uh, the factors of difference between the estimates that the Scottish Government has put out and uh, some of the other forecasts. You know, we are essentially basing our arguments on very clearly quantifiable factors. And we've, you know, we've set out all of these factors. Um, the Deputy First Minister has already talked about um, the price difference. Um, the assumptions that we make are that uh, price it would be at $110 in nominal terms, which is the average of where it has been between March 2012 and March 2014. I'm just where your figures come from. I mean, the Deputy First Minister has explained that. What I'm trying to get at is Professor Hughes Hallett, who you clearly put a lot of store by, has presumably done his own work and come to a completely different set of figures. Well, but the, 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 there's obviously a range of different estimates about uh, oil and gas revenues and oil and gas price forecasts. For example, the Deputy First Minister has made the point about the comparison of um, price forecast between ourselves at $110 in nominal terms, um, OBR at $99, um, the Department for Energy and Climate Change $130 a barrel, and there's OECD estimates that would go even further than that. So, of course, there's a range of different estimates. There's not going to be um, a standard um, assessment. We have to make a, a balanced judgment about these factors. If we then look at production, um, we've been persuaded by 
the industry analysis that assumes, for example, um, a 14 per cent increase in production between 2013 and 2018. And why are we persuaded by that? Well, we're persuaded by that because the self-same industry is currently making about £14 billion pounds worth of investment in the North Sea oil and gas infrastructure. And, um, you know, I think it's a reasonable assumption to make that if companies are making an investment, if they are um, investing very significant sums of private capital in the development of the North Sea oil and gas opportunities, um, there is likely to be returns that arise as a consequence of all of that. So I'm simply trying to map out to the committee the fact that um, the, the conclusions that we've arrived at, which are the ones that we're here to, uh, to talk through and other issues, um, are based on very clearly evidenced okay. uh, material from wider industry. The, two, two, first two, two, two final points I would make very briefly. I mean, one is just a, a contextual point of observation. Andrew Hughes Hallett's written evidence was, of course, prepared before the Scottish Government published its uh, most recent oil and gas analytical bulletin. But, you know, secondly, you know, I know we've all read the, the full evidence. Andrew Hughes Hallett also estimates that Scotland would have a budgetary surplus of about 0.7% of GDP in 2016-17. That's a more optimistic projection of our opening budgetary position than the Scottish Government uh, makes. I, I'd be interested to know whether uh, the convener or uh, the witnesses that you've just heard from would agree with that uh, projection uh, of Andrew Hughes Hallett. So, you know, different projections can be made. Andrew Hughes Hallett is somebody that uh, commands rightly enormous respect. The projections we've made uh, in the bulletin I've spoken about and in our fiscal projections are ones that we think are robust, that are uh, cautious uh, and provide a good foundation for uh, the planning for an independent Scotland uh, that we would do. But it seems to me this, this is quite a fundamental question because, because your proposition for independence is based on there being a sound set of public finances. Now, Professor Hughes Hallett, who clearly is a well-respected uh, advisor to the government, he holds two important jobs. He's currently in line as I understand, to be appointed to another important job, comes out and directly contradicts uh, and has a much more pessimistic outlook on oil revenues than you do. Now, you must think he's wrong. And the question is, if he's wrong about this, what else is he wrong about? He wrote your well, fiscal commission paper. If he gets this so fundamentally wrong that he undermines your case, how can we trust what's in his fiscal commission I've just, I've just pointed to another aspect of his, of his evidence where he's been more optimistic than the Scottish Government in terms of our uh, current So he's constantly uh, contradicting surplus. you? Well, I'm simply saying, you know, Projections can be made. I've got the utmost respect for Andrew Hughes Hallett. What I'm saying is that we've set out uh, very robust projections. We think those are projections that uh, withstand scrutiny, and we're, that's why we're here to uh, subject them uh, to scrutiny. Um, and you know, I've already talked through, as has John uh, already talked through, the, the assumptions that they are based on. Um, and I, you know, again, I would you know just point to the fact that the written evidence that uh, we're talking about here actually predates okay. the most recent oil and gas. Have you asked bulletin. Professor Hughes Hallett to review his evidence to the Finance Committee? Well, you know, Andrew Hughes Hallett is somebody that I'm sure will review whatever uh, of his own projections he feels uh, that he wants to do. He's somebody that uh, I think has on many occasions come before parliamentary committees and uh, put his views forward and been questioned on those views and you know, we continue, as you've pointed out, to uh, take advice uh, from him and from a range of experts and we then put forward uh, the projections that we think okay. are solid and robust, and that's what we've done in this case. OK, he's, he's currently got two appointments. He's, he's on the Council of Economic Advisers. He's also uh, on the Fiscal Commission. There's currently a proposal to appoint him to another job on the Scottish Fiscal Commission, which is to uh, advise uh, government, be an be a, be a independent budget advisor to government. Um, do you still have confidence in him in terms of that new appointment he's going to get on top of all the others? Unreservedly so, convener. Uh, I think Andrew Hughes Hallett has um, a, 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 an, in, an incredible volume of experience on all of these issues, uh, an international academic track record which, uh, is, which speaks for itself um, of very complex and comprehensive character. And the, the, the core purpose of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, to which I am proposing to appoint three members, um, is to provide an independent source of expertise to challenge the assumptions that I make about the likely tax take that um, is coming forward. Now, I think, Kavina, if I, I, I don't wish in any way to be indelicate or impolite, but um, uh, your line of questioning to us this morning so far has essentially been on the premise of 
Professor Hughes Hallett taking a different view on some of these questions to the government. I would have thought that was the strongest argument for him to be a member of the Fiscal Commission to guarantee and to exemplify his independence. And uh, I'm, I think that's a, a pretty strong um, perspective to have on this question. I think, you, also, you, sorry. Sorry, Convera, I think sorry. you know, let's just kind of cut away a lot of this. And I think what John said is absolutely 100% correct there. But you know, if, if I follow your logic here, Presumably, we have to go to the conclusion of, of that. You know, Andrew Hughes Hallett is projected at lower oil revenues, but as he said in his evidence, the purpose of him uh, doing this was not to provide forecasts, uh, but about the issues that must go into the calculation of public finances and whether they would be in surplus or deficit. So he's uh, projected oil revenues that are lower, but has reached a conclusion uh, that says the budget uh, Scotland would be in budget surplus and projecting a more optimistic view in that respect than the Scottish Government. So you can't take uh, the projection around oil revenues in isolation. You've got to actually follow what he has said to its conclusion. And its conclusion is, uh, if, you, uh, if I uh, take uh, your views about we have to take everything uh, like that as gospel, then he gets to a conclusion, which is Scotland is an even stronger position than the one that the Scottish Government has projected us to be in. But I'm interested, Mr Swinney, that you said you had unreserved confidence in, in, in Mr Hughes Hallett, but presumably you don't have unreserved confidence in his, in his figures and his projections, because you fundamentally disagree with well, him. Well, I think if, uh, the Deputy First Minister has made the point that uh, Professor Hughes Hallett estimates that Scotland would have a, a budgetary surplus of around 0.7% of GDP in 2016-17. Now, that is a more optimistic view than the one that I took in the outlook for public finances. Now, I'm simply saying that you know, there is going to be a debate about all of these questions about oil and gas revenues. There will be debate about the um, fiscal forecast that I make about the taxes that will be arising in Scotland. And, but the crucial point, Kavir, is that we must be able to demonstrate the basis upon which we have come to the conclusions that we have done so. And as I was going through with you a moment ago, the, the, the substance of the difference in position that we take on um, that substantiate our uh, projections on, on oil and gas revenues are about taking um, a, a view on price, a view on production and a view on investment. And those are, are, are assumptions which are clearly able to be tested, and I'm sure we'll, 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 we'll test them this morning. Um, but uh, the judgments that we make about the most likely scenario, of course, in other circumstances, judgments have been made about these factors. In the 2009 UK budget, for example, the Chancellor Alistair Darling forecast that North Sea revenue would be 6.6 .6 billion, and it turned out to be 11.3 billion. So, uh, you know, I, I, I simply share that data with the committee to make the point that uh, there will be um, all sorts of different. Uh, assumptions that will be made and conclusions actually generated by economic performance. I think fundamentally we come back to the, the core point, which is that Scotland is uh, a very wealthy country and we are, I think it's an acknowledged point right across the political spectrum that Scotland has uh, the resources and the wealth and the public finances to be independent. The question is what would be the advantages uh, of so doing, and that's what we're here to talk yeah. about. And I understand that, and I understand your case is predicated on us being having a healthier state of public finances if we were independent than we currently are, and you fairly um, drew attention uh, to the fact that there is a, a debate around this. I think that's probably an understatement. Uh, we've already heard this morning from uh, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury that he fundamentally takes a different view, as the UK Government does, on these figures. We've also heard that Andrew Hughes Hallett, your own advisor, takes a fundamentally different view uh, to these figures uh, than you do yourself. So I'm just pointing but, out that in terms of that debate, you, you have a proposition you're taking to defend, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of people taking a different uh, view. Uh, but, there's, but, you know, in relation to... I'm not surprised that the United Kingdom Government... Uh, has got a slightly more pessimistic view of... Yeah, as, as, as does Professor Hughes Hallett, of course. Well, no, 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 actually, he doesn't. <laughs> Professor Hughes Hallett actually has a more optimistic view of the public finances in 2016-17 than, uh, than the material that I've put in the public domain. So, you know, I, I don't see... I, I, I don't understand the relevance of that point, Convener, because uh, Professor Hughes Hallett is setting a, a, a scenario which is more optimistic about the public finances than the one that I've set out. And you, you, you can't pick and choose. None of us uh, can. The bits of the evidence, you know, here's what Andrew Hughes-Hallett says. 
um, on, I think, page four of his written evidence, by all measures, the Scottish fiscal position will be stronger than the UK. And if he reaches that conclusion on the basis of oil revenues that are lower than the oil revenues being projected by the Scottish Government, I can't see how that can be anything other than uh, a positive conclusion for the Scottish Government. OK, I've got two members who want to come in with supplementaries on this point. First one, Chick Rudy. Thank you. Good morning. Just on that point, if I may, I asked the question this morning about the OBR and its forecasting. As Alistair Darling once famously said, it was a wing of the Tory party, confirmed by the first chairman being an advisor to Mrs Thatcher. Um, in the OBR, in the EFO, the, the fiscal outlook, it says our oil price forecast moves in line with the average of the futures curve over the 10 working days to February 27, 2014, for the next two years, i.e. through 2016 and is held flat at that level for the remainder of the forecast period. Movements in oil prices and the sterling dollar exchange rate means that the sterling price of oil is slightly higher than we assumed in an earlier forecast. Isn't it the case that, you know, from the OBR's point of view, the forecasts that we receive, and they say in their own paper in March 2014 that they consider their methodologies of, of assessing tax and, and, and revenues as work in progress, uh, and that uh, the key element in all of this, and the purpose of my question is, in the macroeconomic forecasts, including oil revenues, they say due to the confidentiality of the measures we were unable, this is before the last budget, we were unable to involve the Scottish Government in this stage of the process. How much conversation have the OBR had or what approaches have they made to the Scottish Government to share information? So, at um, ministerial level, I... Um, I don't think I can recall any contact with the OBR, but I think the Chief Economist would be best placed to give us a, a view at official level. Yes, I don't think there's been any ministerial contact. I, I periodically meet with uh, OBR when they're here, giving evidence to committees. I, know, I meet with the chairman, we'll talk about different things, but it's on an ad hoc basis. So uh, we've got methodologies of work in progress from the OBR. We've got Professor or Dr Richard Dyke saying uh, three years ago uh, that there's 100 years of oil left uh, in Scottish waters. We've got Alec Kemp, Professor Alec Kemp saying their estimates are wrong by five to six billion doll, uh, uh, barrels of oil. I mean, I think that, but why, why are we giving any, oh, not us, what, why is any oxygen given to people who have unproven methodologies whose numbers clearly are up and down I just don't understand. Well, I think that, that what I would say, uh, Kavira, is that um, there are you know, there are three factors that um, essentially influence the uh, the calculation of uh, North Sea oil and gas revenues. Um, one will be an assessment of price, and the OBR um, has an assessment of ninety nine dollars in 2016-17, and then remaining flat. Um, we take a view. Um, based on the fact that the average price between March 2012 and 2014 was $110. 110 is a more reliable and cautious as assumption. But it does also include um, the um, uh, uh, essentially a reduction in the cash value because of the, you were retaining that uh, in nominal terms. Secondly, um, a, a different production assessment, and uh, you know, as I said to Kavir a moment ago, I think it's uh, unimaginable that uh, the industry would be making the scale of investment that it is making right. without then um, having confidence in the estimates the industry makes of the likely proceeds of that with a 14% increase in production over the period um, to uh, 2018. Um, and then thirdly, uh, about the scale and the range of investment, and uh, we think that uh, the investment levels um, are likely to uh, return to long-term trend levels. And of course, the, the issue about that is that that then removes the ability to offset as much investment against tax which is one of the reasons why revenues are deflated at present because of the scale of capital investment that is underway. So I think that there's a very clear um, set of, of reasons why uh, the estimates are different. But obviously the OBR, uh, it is up to the OBR to uh, defend their own estimates. But uh, you know, as I've said to Parliament on occasions before, um, the OBR made estimates of likely levels of economic growth in the country that we have not seen. And 
the reason why economic performance, um, it, which is encouraging in the present environment, and nobody's you know, more pleased about the, the, the economic uptake, uh, upturn than myself, the reason why it looks more buoyant is because the performance in 2012 and 2013 was significantly diminished mm. on what the OBR suggested it, should, it, it would and should have been. Thank you. Uh, second supplementary, Richard Baker. Mr Sweeney, um, it talks about production costs. Uh, surely the fact is that the North Sea is a mature basin, so it will cost more to recover the oil there. So you'll have greater investment, uh, but, high, but much increasing production costs, and indeed you know, production has decreased recently. So isn't the impact of this that in the longer term there will continue to be a reduced tax take to enable production to go ahead? And you know, do not agree with what the Wood Review said, that in fact government will have to reduce its tax take from the industry to sustain the industry uh, for the longer term future? I think the, 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 the absolutely fundamental conclusion of the Wood Review was that um, Sir Ian Wood's view and his Commission's view that there was still a very significant economic opportunity that existed in the North Sea oil and gas sector. And of course one of the other great strengths of the oil and gas sector is the fact that uh, production methodology has uh, changed and developed to adapt to the fact that the, um, the recovery of, uh, of oil uh, in the North Sea Basin is now, now requires to be by slightly different methods to the ones that have been previously adopted in the development of the sector. And of course those issues of production costs are factored into the, um, the assumptions that we make about the likely level of activity that can be envisaged as a consequence of, uh, of, of those steps. But Jo Armstrong just said in her assessment what the Wood Review meant was that you know, less tax per barrel than is currently the case is what is required to maintain this, the life of the North Sea. So would you disagree with that? I, I think the... Well, we make, fundamentally, we come to a conclusion about what is the likely level of oil and gas production and the likely revenue flow that is going to emerge from that. And that's what we've published. And we've published that um, uh, transparently a couple of weeks ago and is there for, for, for people to see. Now, now, clearly, I take a different view on um, the pattern of activity than the one that's been set out by Joe Armstrong, yes, because I think there is a much greater opportunity to develop the North Sea oil and gas sector um, if we ensure that we have um, a climate of investment and um, a, a stable policy climate in the development of the sector. It's just worth very briefly adding, I mean, I mentioned in a previous answer two of the key forecast assumptions that underpin uh, the uh, material that we published. Uh, I mentioned uh, the assumptions about price and about production, but the other two are that tax revenues are linked to North Sea operating profits after capital investment, and, and fourthly, that both revenues and costs are assumed to increase. So, you know, all of these factors are taken into account in coming to the projections that we've published. Okay, we should move on. Um, Marco Biaggi. I ask the same question that I asked of Danny Alexander. Uh, in the event of a no vote, is the Barnett formula set in stone? I think well, I can only deduce from the public statements that have been made by um, the Liberal Democrats Commission, the Campbell Commission, uh, that uh, and, and indeed, actually, the Liberal Democrats' 2010 election manifesto, which of which Whatever I think, uh, well, uh, <laughs> well, but um, it was it, it certainly was written by Danny Alexander himself, yes. and it said that uh, the Barnett formula needed to be replaced by a needs-based formula. So, uh, I think um, uh, th th there is significant uh, doubt over the Barnett formula um, in the event of a, of a no vote. Uh, I think also, I'm not sure if I've shared this with the committee before, but uh, I may have done, but I certainly shared it with other committees, uh, certainly there's a, a very strong body of opinion um, in other parts of the United Kingdom that wants to dismantle the Barnett formula. I had the president of the Local, Associ Local Government Association of England um, in to see me uh, some weeks ago, um, who was you know, very clear and very open with me that uh, he wanted to see the Barnett formula dismantled. Of course, the issue about the Barnett formula isn't just about... Um, the, uh, in the event of a no vote, there's a you know, current issue which is flagged up to the Finance Committee um, that uh, the United Kingdom government is trying to argue for a, a change to the Barnett formula as it currently stands today to deal with the 
um, application of the devolved taxes, land and buildings, transaction tax and the landfill tax, uh, despite the fact that um, they made no such proposition in the 2010 command paper, um, where they said that um, the block grant adjustment would be by a one-off change to public expenditure in Scotland. And I'm now involved in negotiations with the United Kingdom government trying to deal with the fact that they want to alter the Barnett formula um, under the current arrangements, regardless of the outcome of the referendum. So I think that, I think from all of that, I think we can only deduce that um, there is a significant uh, threat to the uh, continuation of the Barnett formula as we know it. It's also worth pointing out the potential quantum of that, the work done around the Hotham Commission would suggest that a change from the Barnett formula to a needs-based uh, formula could cost the Scottish budget up to £4 billion a year. So I think people have to be open-eyed uh, about that particular risk. I take it, therefore, the message from Danny Alexander before that there wasn't agreement, uh, or that the, certainly, certainly I didn't take anything from what he said, that there was an agreement between him and the Scottish Government over the, the methodology here. Uh, for adjusting the Barnett formula. Is that valid? Because I understand, I've got the command paper, I was looking at the command paper from 2012, and it seemed to be quite clear in proposing something that everybody signed up to, and the report to the Finance Committee is suggesting something else. So is that an area it's of disagreement? Area, it's an area of current disagreement, yes, where um, essentially I've spent some time trying to say to the UK Government that um, I'm not prepared to, you know, I don't see what the basis of mm -hmm. us having any further adjustment to the... Um, to, well, sorry, my, my, my point to the UK government has been that the command paper says once land and buildings transaction tax and landfill tax are applied, there will be a one-off adjustment to the, uh, the, the block grant. And Parliament, this Parliament, the UK Parliament, voted for the devolution of these tax powers on that basis. Subsequent to that agreement, the ground has now shifted and the UK government is trying to get me to agree to a change to the Barnett formula, which... Uh, I don't think Parliament would be surprised to hear I'm not prepared to do. Um, and I'm currently trying to resolve that issue. But um, it's very material because it obviously has an effect on the assumptions I can make in relation to the formulation of the 2015-16 budget, which I will be considering, well, I'm considering now and considering in the run-up to the announcement of the budget provision to Parliament on the 9th of October. And, of course, there's no independent appeal tribunal, any kind of dispute mechanism other than ultimately what the Westminster Parliament decides to, to back. Am I correct in that understanding? The, the, the st Should they wish to override the, what you the, want? Sta the Statement of Funding Policy is, um, is one of these curious creations of, uh, of the Whitehall machinery. Um, it is designed to agree the financial framework for a devolved Scotland. Um, <coughs> but the two signatories to the Statement of Funding Policy that regulates this issue are the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and the Secretary of State for Scotland. So... Uh, you know, I may, I've got a, lot, a number of issues that I don't like about the Statement of Funding Policy, and I make those points at spending review time, uh, but I'm not a signatory to the document, so, you, so Mr Biagi is correct that ultimately the United Kingdom Government, um, as the uh, determinants of public expenditure, would be able to apply what conclusions they wish to apply in this respect. But if we're operating in an environment of agreement and respect, then uh, mm. I would hope we could come to some agreement on this point. And the final question is, what is the, the precedent that this potentially sets, given that there is discussion of more powers for the Scottish Parliament in the event of a no vote? Now, believe it or not, from, from the no parties, the, the Liberal Democrats have proposed income tax, capital gains tax, inheritance tax, aggregates levy, air passenger duty, assignation of corporation tax, and assignation of dividends and savings taxes. All of those would mean changes to the Barnett formula. So if the UK government is not going with what it signed up to in 2012 in this limited context, what would be the potential uh, damage from, from changing an approach there or the, or the, I, I the think Scottish the, Parliament signing up to something and getting something else? I think the, I think the, the, the evidence in this is quite clear because in the, the UK government's response to the, I, I can't remember the exact, the, 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 
process that they responded to, but in relation to the devolution of further powers to, to the National Assembly of, in, in Wales, uh, the UK Government is making it quite clear that uh, alter, if, if there is a transfer of tax powers and responsibilities, there will be adjustments to the Barnet formula as a consequence. So the Barnet formula is in play now. Mm -hmm. It's very clear from the UK Government that they've got the Barnet formula in play. And my point, which I, I've not been able to persuade them about, is that um, the command paper was crystal clear on these two taxes. It was a one-off adjustment, and that was it. And we're now having to consider alterations to the Barnet formula. And in relation to the Welsh example, the UK government has already gone there to say that there will be changes to the Barnet formula. And so I think it's pretty clear what the direction of travel is from the perspective of the UK government if it comes into the question of any further tax uh, powers being devolved. Richard Baker. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'd like to ask the Deputy First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary, uh, when uh, will you publish your assessment of the start-up cost for government in an independent Scotland? The work um, that we uh, have done around all of these issues is, uh, you will be aware, in the White Paper. And you know, I can point to several different parts of the White Paper that covers uh, this territory on uh, welfare. You'll find it in Chapter 4 and Foreign Affairs and Defence. You'll find it in Chapter 6, particularly pages 206 to 252. And in general, in terms of some of the general principles that underpin this, uh, you'll find it in uh, the material in Chapter 10, I think specifically around pages 343 to 350. Um, we, uh, as you know, and we've set out, and I'll set out again, uh, the reasons why we haven't uh, put a, a figure on uh, that. Uh, we don't want to be in the uh, same territory as the UK government of misbriefing uh, anybody, and I think it is a uh, reasonable question to ask if uh, the Treasury had been capable of putting such a, a, a figure on this, then why did they feel the need to effectively make one up uh, by uh, plucking a figure out of thin air that was then uh, criticised by the author whose work it was based on, and uh, his view, of course, is that it was overestimated by a factor of 12. I mean, basically, the factors at play here, which I'll, I'll run through uh, very briefly, are, are as follows. Uh, much of the infrastructure, and this is you know, reflected in many parts of the White Paper, much of the infrastructure of e delivering services that are currently reserved exists in Scotland. So, you know, I'll take uh, and, and would be part of the share of assets, uh, UK assets, that would transfer to Scotland, the share of the assets that we would be entitled to. So I'll give, you know, just a, uh, one example of that. You know, every single pension paid to a state pensioner in Scotland is administered from Scotland, from one of two pension centres, uh, one in Motherwell and, and one in Dundee. And indeed, many parts, most of the uh, UK welfare system as it relates to people in Scotland is administered in Scotland. So that infrastructure exists. We're not in the position of having to set that up from scratch. That would be a situation in which we would be, uh, as a result of the negotiations that would follow a yes vote, seeking to transfer that infrastructure from uh, the UK government to the Scottish government. And you could uh, also cite uh, similar examples around defence and other areas, uh, for example. Uh, secondly, where we are uh, in the position of establishing new systems, or even in terms of the transfer arrangements that I've spoken about, there will be options and choices for uh, Scottish governments around the timescales that will be involved then. In fact, if I go back to my welfare example, it will be very much, and the expert group in welfare in its first report made this point, it will be very much in the interest of the UK government for there to be a short transition period there because the pension centres that I spoke about, as well as administering pensions to pensioners in Scotland, also administer pensions to many people out with uh, Scotland. There will also be opportunities for the Scottish government to uh, make savings in terms of how we deliver those services, and the Finance Secretary can talk in more detail about Revenue Scotland, which is a perfect example of infrastructure that we are establishing now, where we are able in how we design uh, that infrastructure to deliver efficiency savings that wouldn't be right. available okay. if we were to do that elsewhere. Okay, so you've and been working lastly, this for, for, for almost two years, apparently, and, and, lastly, and you've got no cost you can give us, not even an estimate, a guess, of what the cost will I'm be trying to, for, for the, you know, startups for, for an independent Scotland in terms of government. I mean, Richard, because I, I, you're either interested in the work we've been doing and the output of that <laughs> work, or you just want to score yeah, points. Uh, the third point I was going to make is there will be... Uh, 
uh, of course, a wider negotiation around the totality of UK assets and the share uh, that Scotland will get. Some of those assets, like the ones I've described, will transfer assets that are physically based in Scotland will transfer others. It wouldn't be practical to do that. There might not be a need for that. So there would be a financial consideration required to be made. The uh, assets, and this is uh, based on the UK Assets Register, the UK assets are worth £1.3 trillion. Pounds. So, you know, that's the, the work we've done uh, and, you know, we'll continue to look carefully at these issues. But, you know, I think the Treasury is a, a good example uh, of the dangers uh, that befall you when you try to put uh, a definitive cost on something that will be subject to uh, the kind of negotiation and the kind of factors I've, I've spoken about. And, you know, it was the Treasury uh, in trying to do so that ended up in the position of being criticised by uh, Professor Dunleavy and uh, that stands accused of overestimating these costs by a factor of 12. Yes, but at least a figure has been presented by your government which we can debate, which is in the public, well, which is transparent. We can certainly debate it, yeah. Why, debate why wrong after is. all this work we've heard about, Convener? What, I mean, is the cabinet, is the deputy first minister saying that you have made no assessment of what the total costs of start-up is starting up new government agencies in Penn Scotland would be, or that simply you're not going to tell the people of Scotland what that estimate is? No, I'm telling you about the work we've done and how that appears in the white paper. Yeah. I mean, I can, you know, it, so there's no estimate would, of the overall cost. Well, you know, I can point you to particular parts of the white paper where it goes into, you know, quite considerable detail about, you know, if you take foreign affairs for example, it uh, looks at the. Uh, the UK state and foreign affairs, 5,000 properties valued at 1.9 billion, what a population share, and you know, a population share is not necessarily what will happen here, it will be a, a negotiated share, what Scotland's share of that would be. It looks in detail at uh, what we would be seeking to establish, it looks in detail at the defence assets that a Scottish Government would inherit uh, and how that would uh, form the, the underpinning basis of our defence uh, forces and how we would uh, look to transition defence forces over a period of years in general. Uh, terms, as I say, in Chapter 10, it goes into some of these issues uh, in, and the principles that underpin them. So there is a wealth of work that is evidenced there in the White Paper and would repay, I think, a, a close reading by the member. Well, the, the memorandum um, which Mr Swindy submitted to Cabinet some two years ago stated that work was currently underway in the Office of the Chief Economic Advisor to provide this comprehensive overview of the institution's costs and staff numbers. Is all of that work, therefore, in the White Paper? Can we find all the evidence of that report that was given to Cabinet in this document. Well, it, essentially, the, the, the work that uh, Mr Baker uh, highlights that was referenced in the, the, the document that I put to Cabinet and which is now in the public domain, essentially was setting out um, the tasks that we had to work through to set out the arguments around the proposition of Scottish independence, which culminated in the publication of the White Paper. So the White Paper essentially encapsulates what we consider to be um, the most effective explanation of how all of these issues would be taken forward. And I think the, the point which we cannot avoid here, and uh, you know, Mr Baker's point that um, you know, at least the UK number have put, an, the UK government have put a number out there, it's, a, it's really a very meaningless remark, to be honest, because um, what, the, what we've tried to do is set out the basis upon which we can see the, 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 the transfer of additional functions coming into the Scottish Government, how we would handle that and how essentially elements of that would be subject to negotiation about the precise operational arrangements and also about the, uh, the sharing of assets. And it therefore is, um, you know, to put a specific number on that, we can set out the framework, we can set out the methodology that's all set out in the white paper, we can set it out in as much detail as we can in all the areas that we can possibly do that. And, you know, the example that uh, the Deputy First Minister gives on page 229, for example, the white paper about the issues in relation to international representation are done to be as informative as we can be in the debate. But I think we, we cannot... Um, properly put a precise number into that analysis if it is going to be subject to negotiation and a discussion with the UK government about share of assets and about operational transfer of functions. And so, I, think that's a, I think that's a completely So is it the case that you've made no attempt to estimate what the cost would be or simply that you do have an estimate which you're refusing to publish before the referendum to allow the people of Scotland to make an informed judgment on this very important issue? Well, what, 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 I'm, what I'm saying to, to Mr Baker is that in the white paper, we essentially draw together 
the entire framework of how these issues can be progressed and advanced. And if we can, if we can get to very specific levels of detail around, for example, the number of overseas officers that the Scottish Government would envisage being part of our international network, we quantify that because that's 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 and our the cost of it as well. It, well, of course, we would say the cost is between 90 and £120 million. Pounds. It's there on page 229. So, therefore, you should be able so, to aggregate no, an no, overall no, but, cost but, but, well, quite simply. It would be helpful if Mr Baker would listen to all of the answer I'm giving. Okay. What I'm saying is where we can be very specific about the type of arrangements we envisage, we will put uh, detail in place. But where we quite readily accept that there is a need for negotiation and dialogue with the United Kingdom Government, we have to fairly and honestly reflect that in the white paper. And it would be, you know, if we put in a specific number in there, it would be as much value as the UK government getting itself into the complete guddle that it got itself into um, in the publication of its paper a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, if, if the Treasury thought it was possible to do that, then it does beg the question why they plucked the figure out of thin air. Well, they, 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 the they haven't. They explained did. thoroughly why they got to that figure that they reached. <laughs> no, they and well, and, and, and well, the author of the well, work well, on which on they the base it has said it's I cast, an for example, I cast will have an argument well, across the committee. But, but okay. seriously, uh, right. Convena, right, right, okay, with please. respect, you know, yeah. I think that comment really does deserve to be challenged. They have explained the basis on which they got to that figure. I'll grant you that. They've attempted an explanation. Uh, but it's based on work, uh, the author of which has said they've got it completely wrong and they have overestimated by a factor of 12. So, you know, if the Treasury had been able to get to the precise figure that he's uh, talking about, then they wouldn't have had to engage in that kind of uh, jiggery-pokery about That's it in the way that they did. All right. Okay. Right. We're, we're, we won't conduct this dialogue across the committee. Before we leave this, can I ask you, Dr. Gillespie, seeing as you've kindly joined us this morning, has you, have you or your office done work on these setup costs? I think all the work that's been done is reflected in the in the white paper and the work that the cabinet secretary and, and deputy first minister have outlined. So you've not done any detailed costings that haven't appeared in the white paper. As I say, all of the work's reflected in the government. That wasn't the question I asked you. I didn't ask you if it was reflected. I asked you, have you done? detailed work on cost things that do not appear in the white paper? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move on. Um, Alison Johnson. Um, we heard this week that more than 20 million meals have been given to people in food poverty in the UK by the three main food providers. That's Oxfam, uh, Church Action on Poverty and the Trussell Trust. And um, those figures are from the below the breadline paper that, that you'll be aware of. And they make the case for tackling poverty pay and raising the minimum wage to the living wage. Could Scotland, could an independent Scotland, have a higher minimum wage? And what difference would that make to social security payments, given the fact that the majority of families in poverty are actually working? Well, I think this is a, a very pertinent point and a very timely question. Now, Alison Johnson will be aware that in the white paper... Uh, the current Scottish Government gave a commitment that if we were the Government in independent Scotland, we would guarantee to increase the minimum wage at least in line with inflation every year. It's instructive to note that over the past five years, had that happened, the lowest paid in our society would be £600 a year better off. So, you know, we absolutely accept the importance of uh, tackling and challenging uh, the low wage economy or the aspects of our economy that are based on low pay. Going uh, further than that, again, uh, Alison Johnson will be aware of the second report of the expert uh, working group on welfare that was published last week that makes the recommendation that an independent Scotland should look at over time and with uh, appropriate uh, compensation to businesses to allow them to make the transition, but that over time we should look to raise the minimum wage to the level of the living wage. Um, I said when I uh, launched the report with the, the convener of the group last week that I was sy sympathetic to that. Clearly the government has to give proper and due consideration to recommendations of, of that nature but uh, I think it's fair to say we're looking at that uh, sympathetically and supportively. Uh, and you know, I think the key point here is what drove that recommendation in the expert group report, which uh, Alison Johnson has indicated. You know, if we lift people out of low pay, then we not only improve their quality of life and their ability to uh, have a, a decent quality of life for uh, them and, and their families, but we also reduce social security payments because you know, much of, or at least a significant proportion of social security spend is on uh, tax credits that are being paid to people who are in work but 
earning very low wages. So if we can lift the level of wages, then we say the estimate uh, that the working group put on it was about £280 million, I think, from memory. So you, you do save money on Social Security that can be freed up for investment elsewhere, as well as lifting people out of uh, poverty in a much more effective way. There's also a, a, another <coughs> aspect of that is that the, the, the journey towards um, improving levels of remuneration right across the workforce uh, within Scotland is also goes hand in hand also with an investment strategy to improve the quality of employment within Scotland, which then of itself generates greater economic impact and strengthens the public finances as a consequence. And that's where some of our thinking is reflected in our most recent paper about improvements in productivity levels within Scotland. In our inquiry, we've been looking into the future economy of Scotland, but you know, in my view, a successful economy is one that, that doesn't just focus on GDP, but it's about you know, well-being and, and increased living standards for all. Are there any other specific policies that you could see occurring in an independent Scotland that would broaden that focus? Because you know, sometimes we see economic growth occurring, but it doesn't impact on the lives of far too many Scots. The first, how I'd begin to, to answer that question is by talking about the... Um, the way in which the government has structured its, um, its, its policy performance framework within a devolved Scotland. And it is focused upon, um, yes, the, the primary objective of increasing economic growth and economic performance, but by doing that through what I suppose would be called um, a balanced scorecard of taking into account some of the factors that um, Alison Johnson has referred to of well-being, of sustainability, of geographical inequality, intergenerational inequality, and by essentially establishing that as a template of what we're trying to achieve in our economic performance. And then the policy interventions we make would be designed to try to um, achieve that and improve that. So, for example, um, the measures that we take on um, trying to shift the emphasis of investment onto, um, you know, by, by using the tax system, which we can't do just now, to incentivise research and development, for example, would be to try to improve the quality of, of employment within the Scottish economy and to improve the level of private sector research and development expenditure, where we have a very poor and a consistently poor level of private sector research and development expenditure in the Scottish economy, when compared to some of our uh, counterpart countries. Uh, the difference between Scotland and Finland on private sector R&D expenditure is a factor of five. Um, so, you know, there are, and, and clearly, um, if there is more private sector R&D investment, the likelihood is of better quality employment and, as a consequence, better remuneration and uh, the, the, an economic benefit that arises as a consequence. And then, of course, if there is the, the benefit, as the Deputy First Minister has highlighted, of a reduction in um, social security costs, there is the opportunity to redeploy public finances in a different fashion to try to support long-term and sustainable investment as a consequence. So, yes, there are a variety of different ways in which we can intervene to deliver that better uh, level of performance. You spoke about the, the tax system. Now, public services obviously cost money, and I'm a huge fan of public services, and I do have concerns about your announcements with regard to corporation tax and air passenger duty. Uh, you now, obviously, some taxes desperately need redesigned. I think you know the work on stamp duty is a good example of that. But do you agree that there's a need to secure better public services through taxation? I think we have to ensure that uh, you know we. Uh, have a tax system that both in terms of its design and who it's raising money from and the overall amount of money it's raising is capable of supporting uh, the quality public services we want to see. And you know, the key point at the heart of uh, our argument is there is no requirement to raise taxes in Scotland to fund the public services uh, that we've got. Now, individual tax decisions will be for future governments of an independent Scotland uh, to take. Um, we, as you uh, have pointed out, make a, a specific or a couple of specific recommendations, one on corporation tax, one on air passenger uh, duty. If you take corporation tax, and I appreciate there's a, a range of different views on, on that, but it is a policy with a very clear purpose in mind. We recognise that if we're to have the good quality public services and the kind of society we want, and I think we would probably share a, a view on what uh, that should look like, then we need to earn the wealth 
to pay for that. So having a competitive rate of corporation tax is all about generating and supporting economic growth, encouraging more investment in Scotland that leads to more people employed, more people paying tax. You know, having more people... You know, we, we have debates about uh, tax and public service, and it all... I think almost always gets reduced to, you know, should people make pay, pay more tax? Actually, I want to see more people in work paying the tax that, you know, we currently pay, and that is how we increase the tax revenues that, that we've got, which is why in the paper we referred to earlier on, we put so much emphasis on getting participation in the labour market rates up, increasing productivity, growing our working age population. So we're increasing our tax take, but we're not doing it by taxing people more, we're having it, uh, doing it by having more people productively contributing in the economy. Okay. Can I ask one more question, <coughs> Convener? Um, other political parties are offering further devolution in the event um, of a no vote. Um, do you have any faith that the, the offers will help address the poverty and inequality that have blighted society for far too long? Do you think they could help you know, propel a more successful Scottish economy or do you see them simply as alternative funding mechanisms? I mean, I, I come from the perspective that says I want this parliament to be as powerful as possible. Um, so, you know, I, I suppose on one level welcome the fact that the other parties you refer to are you know, belatedly, but nevertheless now seeming to be embracing the principle that it's better to have decisions made here <coughs> rather than uh, at Westminster. Um, I, I suppose I would have two uh, issues that lead to me being very sceptical about the offers that you refer to. One is the extent of the powers that are being offered. Um, you know, obviously, there is no agreement between the parties on the no side of, of the debate about what more powers should be devolved to Scotland. Uh, but you know, even if you take... Uh, I think the, the maximalist position, which I think uh, the convener might disagree, but I think would uh, be the, the Liberal Democrats' position, still leaves the vast bulk of our tax base in the hands of Westminster, still leaves uh, almost all welfare policy in the hands of Westminster, and we know the damage from experience right now that Westminster governments can do with welfare policy would still leave power over immigration in the hands of Westminster. So I look at the various offers and I just don't see that they add up to enough to really enable this parliament to address the challenges that we face and maximise the, the opportunities that we have. And my second point would be, you know, I suppose just around a, a degree of scepticism about the deliverability um, and whether on the other side of a no vote in September uh, there would be the political will to deliver any extra new powers to Parliament. The parties uh, that are now offering more powers weren't keen to see that option on the ballot paper. Um, so it's not on the ballot paper, so there's no cross that people can... Uh, in the no box that people can put their cross in to guarantee those extra powers. We know from past experience that my colleague, Mr Swinney, remembers more clearly than I do in 1979, uh, obviously, but um, only, only slightly, I, I hasten to add, of, of Scotland being offered more powers if they voted no, only to end up with 18 years of Conservative government. So I think we have to have a degree of healthy scepticism um, about the, the more powers and, and, and why we're getting these offers at, at this particular moment. I'm sorry, John. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, we are... Yeah, okay. We need to chop up a little bit, I think, yeah. on questions and responses. Uh, John McCall. Thank you very much, Convener. If you could bear with me. Um, this morning I was questioning Mr Alexander about his uh, briefing paper that he released based on Professor Dunleavy's figures, which Professor Dunleavy then dismissed. And Mr Alexander wouldn't explain why that paper was misleading or why he chose to mislead the public in that way. But what I've, I don't know if you caught this evidence, but he did seem to be sticking with the 1.5 billion figure quoted by Professor Young, uh, which has also been dismissed by Professor Young himself. What would be your response to that? I think my, my, my response would be to essentially look at how, how you would be able to come to a conclusion on this question. Uh, and you can only do that by essentially um, having a, a, a concluded view on how the... Um, that the final arrangements of the governance of Scotland would be established after independence. And 
that will be product of negotiations. So inevitably there will be an element of that, and we've gone through some of this detail already about you know, how uh, transition periods would operate about using uh, uh, about uh, on the welfare system or on other aspects of, um, of functions that might remain um, shared functions uh, on a, a temporary basis or on a permanent basis. All of these questions are material to coming to that judgment. So just trying to take a scenario um, which was a you know on the the, the one point five billion scenario a sort of um, an assessment based on um, some analysis that had been undertaken in Quebec, but then have that undermined by Professor Young in the fashion that Joe McAlpine talks about, I think doesn't make that any more robust an assumption than the original um, uh, fatal error of trying to extrapolate Professor Dunleavy's work to get to a £2.7 billion pound figure. Thanks very much. My other question would be about the Institute of Fiscal Studies. You'll be aware that the Institute of Fiscal Studies have been mentioned quite a lot this morning. Um, brought out a report in February of this year saying that more than half of the UK government's cuts were still to come in terms of public services. In the event of a, a no vote, what are the implications of that for Scotland? The, the point which is, um, is, is, is difficult to be precise about is exactly what impact this would have on the Dell budget, which is the budget that I currently have uh, control over, uh, or the annually managed public expenditure, which is the, essentially the welfare budget and, um, and, and some pension costs uh, and debt interest, of course. If the, you know, assuming the UK government was to follow through with that pattern of reductions in expenditure, and the question then prevails is how big is the hit going to be on welfare versus how big is the hit going to be on devolved public expenditure? But the conclusion is that it has to come somewhere in that analysis. And what the UK government hasn't set out is how much further they would go on welfare and if they don't go, if they don't make significant savings uh, more beyond the, the ones that they've set out on welfare, then those cuts have to fall on the departmental expenditure limits which affect our public services, which are our health service, our education service, local government transport, etc. Um, so it's difficult to, um, to separate those functions because the, the UK government hasn't done that analysis and hasn't published it. But, um, it certainly is a very clear agenda of significant reductions in public expenditure. And my final question, convener, is in terms of the paper that you published a couple of weeks ago on um, economic outlook for Scotland uh, post-independence, um, you talk about the effect of a growth in employment on uh, GDP, national wealth. Could you explain a little bit more about how, how the powers of independence will allow us to grow employment, what your industrial strategy would be? Um, a, a great deal of it would focus on essentially using the, the, the powers that we would have at our disposal to create a more attractive climate to undertake research and development activity within Scotland and therefore as a consequence to drive um, future growth within the economy. Um, we, have, we are fortunate to have very, a very strong um, university research uh, network and establishment with growing connections with the business community. I don't think we are nearly sufficiently getting the proceeds of that good working in terms of the launch of new ventures, the uh, application of new technologies and the ability to, um, to support those new technologies to, uh, to, 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 to wider markets. So that's a, a crucial part of our economic strategy would be to encourage um, higher quality, in, uh, higher levels of investment and higher quality uh, investment opportunities as a consequence. Secondly, there are obviously some of the measures that we would take in trying to improve the competitiveness of Scotland and, you know, though there may not be um, tax measures that um, uh, appeal to Alison Johnson, they are powerful measures in relation to improving the connectivity of Scotland through air passenger duty or through the, the, the attractiveness of Scotland as a business uh, location. And, of course, we know 
from our existing performance that Scotland already is a very attractive uh, destination for inward investment, we need to make that ever more significant. And thirdly, um, we need to um, uh, intensify the efforts that we undertake to encourage more and more Scottish companies to become involved in international business activity and to export their goods and services to a wider audience. And one of the very interesting, powerful examples of this from, for example, the um, oil and gas sector is that the oil and gas sector is now made up of two very distinct components. One is the production activities in the North Sea, but uh, the other is the enormous export activity that is undertaken in skills, technology and expertise to other jurisdictions to support the development of the oil and gas sector based on the experience that has been gained here in Scotland. And then finally, um, I think we are in a very strong position given the um, leading position we have on uh, sustainable forms of energy um, to uh, encourage that internationalisation by development of our renewable energy uh, potential, which is clearly attracting significant international interest. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Good morning again. Uh, I have one question for Mr Swinney and one for uh, Deputy First Minister. Before I do that, I may. Mean, yesterday I was at Harrington in, uh, to Compass School, and uh, <clears throat> one of the pupils there, they were all asking questions, and one of them uh, said, if we were to have our own currency, he suggested it should be called the Thistle Bucks. I promised I would tell the Cabinet Secretary to finance that, uh, but I assured him we will continue with sterling. Anyway, um, Scotland uh, is trade surplus in 2013 was £2.8 billion. Pounds. The UK was 20, had a deficit of 29.5 billion. I don't want to get involved in scaremongering, but if we take out Grangemouth and Elgin, for the last five years, our current budget balance has been better than the rest of the UK. Our net fiscal balance has been better than the rest of the UK. If we look at uh, situations uh, uh, across some of the regions of the UK, uh, child poverty is... Uh, in some cases worse than in Scotland, but still very bad. I just wonder, what's your view of what might happen to the rest of the UK, given their 1.3 trillion deficit and they pull out of Europe? Being good partners and good neighbours, what do you think will happen to the rest of the UK, given all of these figures? I think, that, well, I think what the, the economic data tells us is that there is a, a fundamental imbalance in the United Kingdom economy. And the... the um, I think the, the, the data is pretty clear that um, we have succeeded in Scotland in creating um, a stronger economic platform than has been possible to be created in a number of the regions of England and in other uh, devolved administrations. Um, um, but we have not been able to create the type of economic powerhouse um, an intensity of activity that is uh, in and around the southeast of England, and that has been that's been a you know it's been a factor you know, largely for the entirety of my adult life, um, and I think that will cause significant economic imbalances within the rest of the United Kingdom, and um, the uh, the inequality gap I think will just grow yet further, and the the issue why you know we attach enormous significance, and it goes back to the formulation of our the performance framework, Scotland performance back in 2007, on the tackling of inequality, where we possibly can tackle it, because it is a major social and economic challenge and difficulty for any society. It's a challenge and difficulty for us in Scotland. It is an even greater challenge within the United Kingdom, and will be an even greater so challenge in the rest of the UK uh, after independence. Um, as for the question of, of, of EU membership, um, I, I have no, no secret of the fact that I think the Prime Minister has started off um, uh, on a very reckless journey in relation to European uh, Union membership. And I think we, um, we have an opportunity in September to avoid um, getting into the difficulties of EU membership that I think the UK will get into in 2017. Thank you. And Deputy First Minister, I wonder if I may ask... Um, without getting into detail, the oil and gas numbers again. A Bank of Scotland report on the 4th of April 2014 indicated that 39,000 jobs could be created 
uh, directly in 2014 in the oil and gas production and also in the very major <laughs> supply chain. Huge opportunity. Um, however, within that, only 4% of the total workforce are women. Uh, and I just wonder what comment you could make in terms of how we, I know you, some of the work that you're already doing, but how we can encourage uh, more women to become involved in, in this, this huge opportunity. I think the uh, report you referred to on oil and gas, and the first comment I would make is it underlines the fact that oil and gas and the oil and gas industry is an enormous advantage and, and bonus for Scotland. Sometimes in this debate it can seem a wee bit uh, weird to hear it you know, described as if it's this enormous burden. You know, many, many countries across the world would love to be in the position we're in. I think the challenge for the future is to steward it properly to make sure we can maximise uh, the revenues that have yet to come from uh, the North Sea and steward those revenues in a way that allows us not just to uh, meet current needs but also leave something for, for future generations. In terms of your point about uh, female employment, and it's a very important point, and you know, I'll, I'll try and be brief here because I think there's various different strands to an answer to that question that go from uh, encouraging uh, women, young girls, to see the kind of job opportunities and careers that you're talking about in terms of the oil and gas industry as, as attractive and make sure that we've got the right uh, skills in place, that they are getting access to modern apprenticeships and, and skills opportunities in uh, the kinds of jobs and professions that perhaps traditionally women have tended uh, not uh, to go into. Um, and, you know, Angela Constance, as the, the Minister for uh, Youth Employment, obviously is, is very focused on some of these issues. I think there's a more uh, generic uh, part of the answer to that question, which is around ensuring that we provide the social policies that support women who want to, uh, to go into the labour market or return to work to uh, pursue careers. And that's where the childcare policy that we set out in the white paper and uh, has been talked about many times in the past is, is so important uh, to make sure uh, that costs of childcare, which in the UK just now I think are amongst the, the highest of, of any country in Europe, are not a barrier to, to women who want to returning to work and, and reaching the, the full potential of their career. So, you know, I think um, there's a, a range of things I think we need to to do. Some of them we are trying to progress now. Some of them will be, will be more able to progress with the powers of independence. The, the pay gap, 44 years after the Equal Pay Act uh, was passed, is another challenge. And you know, having the ability as the Scottish Government to set out the timescale and the implementation plan for that, I think, would be an enormous advantage to, to many women who are currently not being paid fairly and equally for the work that they do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Margaret McDougall. Um, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, in the white paper, it mentions redistribution of wealth. Um, like much of what's in the wealth, the white paper, there are no policies or you know <coughs> how this is going to happen. Could you perhaps tell us today what policies you have on the redistribution of wealth and how we will tackle inequalities through that? Well, I mean, I, I take the completely opposite view to, to Margaret McDougall. I think the white paper is full of. Uh, policy propositions that would, not overnight, because you can't tackle these problems overnight, independence is not a magic wand, but policies flowing from having our hands on the levers of power that would allow us to tackle some of the deep-seated inequalities. So in the uh, white paper, I've just mentioned you know, childcare. Um, we, I was talking earlier on to uh, Alison Johnson about some of our proposals both in the white paper and some proposals that would flow from the expert working group on welfare around how we redesign a welfare system to lift people out of poverty, to make sure people are being properly supported into work, they're getting paid a fair and decent wage when they are in work, but also a welfare system that ensures we have a decent uh, safety net. Some of what the Finance Secretary has been talking about uh, around using economic powers to ensure that the quality of jobs that we're uh, helping to create for people that have uh, a level that again helps to lift people out of poverty. Of course, I can point to a whole <coughs> range of uh, policies that we're currently uh, implementing in uh, the devolved setup that are about protecting the incomes of the lowest paid. Uh, you know, our uh, social wage set of policies are very important to us. I know uh, Labour are currently going through a, a process of deciding which ones of these they want to 
keep and which ones they want to get rid of, but we are very committed to the council tax freeze, to uh, free access to university. I you know, came from a working class background in uh, the west of Scotland. I wouldn't have gone to university. I wouldn't be sitting here right now if I hadn't had access to free university. And that, for me, is one of the key policies uh, that we have introduced and are committed to maintaining in order to ensure that regardless of your background, you get the chance through education to reach your potential. So I'm very proud of the current po policies of this government that are about closing the inequality gap, maximising opportunity for people uh, regardless of background, and I know that the <coughs> powers that come with independence will allow us to build on that. Mm -hmm. And would allow any government in an independent Scotland, uh, including a Labour government, if they had the political will yeah. to build on that. Um, you know, you've spoken mostly about inequalities, but I'm asking as well about your policies on redistribution of wealth and could you perhaps... Well, I think, I think all about that is about you know, closing the inequality gap, is about redistribution, redistributing uh, the, the current allocation of, of wealth across our society. All of it is about making sure that we're lifting people out of poverty, raising uh, their income levels by making sure, for example, that they get a decent pay, day's, uh, pay for a decent day's work, ensuring that young people, regardless of the background they come from, can uh, use education as a route out of poverty. All of this is absolutely integral uh, to that task, which I think is one of the most important tasks facing Scotland over the next few years of closing a gap that, as part of the mm -hmm. UK, is widening. But the final point I'd make uh, to Margaret McDougall on this, and it's, it's quite an important point here, is if you don't agree with the policies of the SNP for an independent Scotland. That's fine. That is your entitlement. Put forward some of your own policies about how we'd use the levers of decision-making power in an independent Scotland to do things better if you think mm -hmm. that we're not proposing things that, that live up to that. Because, you know, be ambitious. There might be a Labour government in an independent Scotland able to implement yeah. the kind of Indeed, policies sure you think. <coughs> Just, um, if I could speak, to, uh, ask Mr Swinney a uh, question around... Uh, wealth and I noticed that the, the Deputy First Minister steered away from mentioning taxation as a way of dis redistributing oh, wealth. I'd yes, a long answer and taxation the answer um, to my question. So if Mr Swinney could perhaps um, tell us how he mentioned tax take a couple of times this morning. What consideration has been given to tax take and tax levels in an independent Scotland? The first point I'd say is that, um, that you know, we make uh, in the white paper um, <coughs> we make it clear that uh, there is no necessity for there to be an increase in taxation for the public finances of an independent Scotland to be sustainable. So the, the, you know, we would inherit the tax <coughs> rates that are currently in place in the United Kingdom and it would be up to the government of an independent Scotland to, to change and vary those as that government had a mandate to do so, with the exception that we make clear that there's a, a particular provision in relation to the uh, tax allowance for married couples that we would not apply and we would redeploy the savings from that to other purposes. And so essentially the, the, the choices would be there for a government to determine what was the um, appropriate tax measures to take. Um, I think based on the, elect the electoral mandate that they sought and, and, and took forward. The second point I'd make is that we have an opportunity as, uh, and I think this is pretty widely acknowledged, um, I think if I, if I attribute it correctly, I think I attribute it correctly to the Institute for Fiscal Studies, um, but certainly to other organisations, that um, being a smaller country gives us the opportunity to operate a more efficient tax system and to actually... Uh, set out to embark on collecting the tax that is that is that is rightfully due. Uh, I've just spent before I came to this committee this morning. I spent the morning with the finance committee going through amendments to the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill, where I'm setting out for the first time in legislation in Scotland the approach we will take towards um, tax collection and tax management. And a couple of fundamental principles in that bill are a very very high level of intolerance towards tax avoidance and uh, we've just chewed over with the finance committee again this morning whether there's more I could do to stretch that and I'm, I'm, I'm open to those discussions but that's an important point about tax take that we actually set out from day one that we are deadly serious about collecting the tax that we want to collect and that we're going to design a system which is based on 
that collection rather than on um, essentially um, the opportunities for creative planning, if I can put it euphemistically, uh, can often be uh, applied in the tax system within the country. And we, and by operating in that more efficient climate, as we've also demonstrated with the costings of Revenue Scotland, where there's a 25 per cent saving to the public purse as a consequence of the activities of Revenue Scotland, I think we've got a lot to, um, to be confident about, about the approach that we take and tax take. Mm -hmm. um, right. Uh, we've heard about how you wouldn't increase taxation within Scotland in an independent Scotland. That, that's what you're, you're saying. So, and yet we're hearing that, that pensions, for example, you're not going to increase or you're unlikely to increase the retirement age. We have an ageing population. Uh, we've heard this morning from witnesses that that cost is likely to be around £6 billion. How are you going to balance the books given that uh, you know, we're not going to see any increase in taxation to cover pensions or welfare systems. I thought, I, I thought it was nice that um, Margaret Mudugo referred to uh, a panel of witnesses this morning as if there were some kind of independent authorities on the subject. They were two representatives of the United Kingdom government. So uh, you know, just, I only offer that to, um, to just say that maybe we weren't That's coming here with the most... witnesses. They are, they're, they're just any old witnesses, I know. Um, any old witnesses that turn up any other week. Um, they, uh, obviously, the, uh, you know, on the issue of the, the retirement age, for example, we've set out in the white paper that we would explore um, the justification for what is a rapid change in policy to increase the retirement age from 66 to 67. And watching the timescale for that has been dramatically accelerated. <coughs> and we're going to look at that again based on the fact that the, although there is a, um, although life expectancy is improving, there is still a, 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 a relatively poorer experience in life expectancy in Scotland compared to other parts of the United Kingdom. And what independence gives us the opportunity to do is to consider um, whether there is a necessity to move to that increased um, uh, retirement age, um, and we've set out the details of that in the, the white paper. And uh, crucially, uh, all of these judgments would have to be made um, within the, the, the wider judgment that we make around the sustainability of the public finances, which of course are, uh, would be the routine decisions of government to make. And the other point just to briefly make is, you know, if you look at things like pensions and welfare and all of the services that are currently delivered on a reserve basis by the UK government, you know, we pay for all of these. We pay for all of these out of our taxes and our national insurance contributions. So we don't get them for free. Uh, you know, we, we contribute to that. And if we look at social protection, which includes spending on pensions and welfare, it constitutes a lower share of our GDP and a lower share of our tax revenues than is the case for the UK as a whole. So our starting point in these things is that we're in a more affordable and sustainable position. Like any government, uh, we have to, uh, any government of an independent Scotland, like any government of any independent country has to be fiscally responsible and balance the books. Um, I think John Swinney's got a better record in doing that than uh, some of his UK counterparts have had uh, over uh, recent years. So I think we start in a strong position and independence is about giving ourselves the ability to access our own resources and make our own judgments about how those resources are best spent. Thank you. Yep. Thank, you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, you may not be aware, but uh, earlier on this morning when we had Danny Alexander and Alistair Carmichael here, they seem to be very proud of the fact that thanks to their policies, a growing and a very large number of people in the UK now no longer pay any taxes at all because they're earning such a little amount of money. Would you agree that there's scope... Um, in, in, in terms of what you were talking about earlier on in creating a higher wage economy, that we move towards that for um, those people to benefit, those people at the lower end of the earning spectrum, um, but also the Scottish Exchequer to benefit from an increased tax take without raising taxation rates at all? I, th I think there's a. Um, I think it's important that. Um, people in low incomes are protected, but what worries me about the current debate is that we almost um, accept 
low pay as a fact of life. And uh, I don't want to accept low pay as a fact of life. Um, we need to take steps to improve the level of remuneration that some people are, uh, well, large numbers of people are living on. And um, that's why in all of our arguments we set out the case for moving to a higher value economy, the consequence of which would be to improve the remuneration of individuals. But, you know, I suppose to be absolutely honest about it as Finance Minister, I've got a vested interest in ensuring people are earning more money so they're able to pay uh, proportionately more in taxation as a consequence of earning more money. Thank you. And, and moving on just to um, the oil and gas um, in terms of taxation, though, um, it, it seems to me that talking to people in the industry that um, George Osborne's tax raid in 2011 had a very negative effect and that the, the, the 16 significant fiscal changes over the previous decade had the, the kind of cumulative effect of depressing the industry. Um, and also, therefore, possibly the tax revenues that accru accrued from that industry. Does, would you care to comment on that? I think, the, uh, I think it's beyond dispute that the 2011 tax changes were a disastrous, had a disastrous impact on the industry and they interrupted investment, they inter interrupted um, development of the sector. The fact that uh, the UK government had to take, you know, we spoke about these measures in 2011 with a sense of celebration and achievement, and by 2012 they were taking a completely different tack. So that tells, I think that tells us all we need to know, that even the United Kingdom government realised they'd got it spectacularly badly wrong in 2011. Um, I think that given the, you know, one of the points that I would agree with um, the, the line of questioning that Mr Baker was taking earlier on, is that there is a necessity for the industry, given the, uh, the, the, the challenges of a mature basin, is that we have a more stable regime in place for, um, for companies in which to operate and to invest. Uh, so therefore, creating that more stable regime would be a priority for the Scottish Government. Uh, and just moving on to the, the OBR analysis, my reading of that seems to suggest to me that there are quite a number of areas of taxation that are associated with oil and gas, but which the OBR do not include in their analysis. And um, you mentioned supply chain, international supply chain being very, very significant now, but um, it seems to me it doesn't, and, and, and going on from a, a recent Bank of Scotland report that suggested that uh, we'll see an increase of 39,000 jobs in oil and gas um, over the next two years. Um, it seems to me employment taxes will increase as a result of that, and that though BR is not capturing all the taxation that will result from a kind of renaissance we're now seeing in oil and gas, do you think that's a reasonable assessment? I think there's, um, well, there's, cer there's certain changes that have been made to uh, the calculation of oil and gas revenues where the OBR um, have shifted essentially the emphasis of, or elements of, the, of what historically would have been the tax take that would flow into North Sea oil and gas revenues and uh, accounted for it in different ways. And of course that obviously has an effect on, it doesn't take the tax income away, but it, it affects the, the presentation and the arguments around about that. Um, I think that the, the, there's a key point about the oil and gas industry is that um, a very, very substantial proportion of the employment within the oil and gas sector is very high value employment, very high value employment, and there's obviously a significant tax benefit arising out of that into the bargain. And I suppose finally it comes back to the, the point I was making earlier on, um, whereby there are two distinct components to the oil and gas sector. There is the production activity in the North Sea Basin, but there is also the um, very substantial domestic and international business that arises out of the, um, the, the, the technology and expertise that is exported from the, 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 the oil and gas sector within Scotland. Yeah, um, and going on now to currency union, I was quite shocked this morning to hear Danny Alexander say that um, they had really taken no account of the value of Scotland's exports and their contribution to the UK balance of trade deficit in informing their thinking about whether or not they should maintain a currency union with Scotland after independence. Now, I was really quite shocked at that. Um, Mr Alexander didn't seem to feel that was at all significant. 
Uh, would you could you comment on that, please? Well, I think it, I think it's um, I think it's symptomatic of um, the fact that fundamentally um, the Treasury um, a team have taken um, a, you know an entirely political and campaigning stance on this question, and uh, it will change in the event of a yes vote. And my final question, convener, um, just a brief one, but again, um, bo both Mr Carmichael and Mr Alexander seem to suggest that after independence, the UK will not buy Scottish energy, but uh, DEC just yesterday um, uh, released a further warning about um, UK energy security, suggesting that they may have to take some old generating plant out of the mothballs, they've relaxed some of the um, uh, safety requirements on, on carbon rods for nuclear power generators. Um, it seems to be not credible that they won't continue to um, uh, buy energy from Scotland after independence, given that we export a fair degree already south of the border. I, I, th I think that's a, a fair conclusion to draw. I think the issues around energy supply and energy security to the rest of the United Kingdom um, it will require a continued um, active relationship with uh, generators in Scotland, not least of which in fulfilling um, the um, carbon reduction targets of the United Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, lastly, Stuart Maxwell. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I take the witnesses to the issue of air passenger duty? Um, a study by York Aviation in October 2012 found that APD rates in the UK had increased by around 160% for short-haul flights and between 225 and 360% for long-haul flights since 2007, and that uh, by 2016 the likely impact of that would be £210 million less being spent per annum in Scotland by inbound visitors than if APD had not risen uh, in that fashion since 2007. Given that, first of all, do you, do you accept the, the analysis by York Aviation um, that I've just mentioned, and what is your, the Scottish Government's view of the impact of the current APD rates uh, on the Scottish economy? Um, well, I mean, I'll kick off. I, I yeah, broadly accept the, the York uh, uh, research that you refer to, um, and you know the numbers that you have quoted. I think paint uh, the picture of the damage that APD is doing to our airports, to tourism, and to the, the broader. Economy. I, you know, I, I'm sure members would have heard uh, Gordon Dewar from Edinburgh Airport on the radio just yesterday morning when he was outlining, you know, very very powerfully in my view and from a completely non-political standpoint, uh, the the impact of APD on on how they operate. And you know, he explained the disadvantage that him and his colleagues start with every time they go into a negotiation uh, with an airline about a new route. They're starting uh, behind because they have to factor in the, the impact of APD. Um, you know, I, I think the case for uh, being able to reduce or get rid of APD is overwhelming. And, you know, I, I think I would uh, pray in aid of, of that statement the fact that, you know, we just last week had uh, the Conservatives saying that they thought APD should be devolved. Now, I suppose what I would say is if you believe that, uh, then you must believe it is right for the Scottish Government to be making decisions about APD, and if you do think that's the case, then get on and do it. Why are we waiting? If we had the ability now to do something about APD, then we could start to deal with some of the impacts on the economy that you have uh, described, and you know, I can't for the life of me see why we We've been in this position for several year, years now of trying to make that case, seemingly making the case in principle, but being unable to get to a position where the uh, UK <coughs> government agrees to do it. Yeah, can I, uh, certainly, I asked the, the um, previous two witnesses this morning uh, from the UK government uh, the similar question to, I'm about to ask you. But the Strathclyde Commission and the Campbell Commission, uh, both the Conservative and uh, Liberal Democrat parties' views on uh, the Constitution, um, stated that APD should be devolved. And in fact, the Strathclyde Commission went on to say that there is no need for fresh legislation. Um, given that's the case, and it seems to be that everybody now agrees that APD should be devolved and there's no need for fresh legislation for it to happen, do you find it rather confusing, at least, that uh, Dan Alexander this morning said that um, we would have to wait after a no vote before yeah. such legislation could, uh, sorry, such a devolution of APD could happen? Um, yes, although, you know, for me, it would simply kind of lead back to. 
uh, the comment I made, I think, in response to Alison Johnson about my scepticism about whether these powers will actually ever be delivered in the event of a no vote. Because if you, uh, and by you I'm talking here about both the Conservatives and the Liberals, because as you rightly say, both of their policies now is devolution of APD. So if that is a sincere position, if it can be uh, delivered without, as you say, primary legislation, then why on earth would you sit back and wait Absolutely. in order to do it? You would get on and, you know, perhaps it would be a way for uh, both the Conservatives and the Liberals to show some good faith that they actually are serious about more powers and the fact that they <coughs> don't appear uh, willing to do that, I think uh, certainly heightens the scepticism in my mind. I have uh, written to uh, the UK government uh, making this point, asking them to, to get on with it. And to the best of my knowledge, I haven't yet received a response. But there can be no justification, if you believe it's right to devolve APD, uh, not to just get on and do it. Can I ask about the... the you may be aware of the, uh, the study and e the economic impact of air passenger duty. Uh, there has been um, question marks raised about if you cut a tax, in this case air passenger duty, how do you fill the... to use the terminology of some of the, uh, the other parties, a black hole in your finances. Uh, the economic impact of air passenger duty study published in February 2013, UK-wide said that AP, abolishing APD would boost the UK GDP by 0.46% in the first year and continuing benefits up to 2020. It said that the uh, UK economy would be boosted by at least £16 billion in the first three years and result in almost 60,000 extra jobs across the UK in the longer term. Um, is that the Scottish Government's analysis of the impact of abolishing APD in Scotland? Would it, in fact, not result in a black hole in the finances, but an increase? That's the whole point of, of doing it. And, you know, again, you know, people in the airport industry will, will make this point. It's about, if, if you, I mean, just take tourism, if by getting rid of APD you're able to be more successful in establishing uh, air routes, if you get more tourists coming into Scotland, these people will be spending more money here, they'll be paying uh, VAT on the things that they buy, so you'll be growing uh, revenue. So that, you know, and as you say, it's borne out by independent analysis. Getting rid of APD will actually benefit the economy because it takes away a blockage to growth, uh, growth in tourism and growth in uh, the wider economy. But can, I, can I, ask, I add one additional point to what the Deputy First Minister said? But the crucial point about this being a power that we could exercise with independence as opposed to being exercised under a devolved environment is that under independence we would be able to bear the fruits of the investment and the decision. So the, v, the increased VAT, the increased economic activity, the increased employment, all of that would flow into the exchequer of a Scottish, an independent Scottish government. I would be deeply sceptical based on my experience that I was discussing with Mr Biaggi about block grant adjustments that would see any of that under devolution. Now, one final quick question on a, on a separate subject. Mr Carmichael the, uh, this morning uh, distanced himself from the, the, um, the UK government's uh, patronising campaign about using Lego figures um, to discuss the benefits of staying in the Union. Can I just confirm that the Scottish Government, under no circumstances, would spend £30,000 on Lego? I think... Well, I can see as Finance Minister, in my professional capacity, that I would not be spending £30,000 on Lego uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government. I can't rule that out as the father of a three-year-old son <laughs> who adores Lego. So um, I'm not quite sure I can... Uh, I hope that's a sufficiently careful answer that I've given to Mr Maxwell. Thank you. OK, good. On that note, uh, I think that's a, a, a nice uh, end to our discussions. Can I take this opportunity to thank our witness this morning for coming in and helping us with our inquiry? Uh, and indeed, as this is the last public session of our inquiry, can I just put on record my thanks to all those who have given us evidence? Uh, either in writing or orally over the last uh, four months uh, of our inquiry. Uh, I can also take the opportunity on behalf of uh, the committee members to thank our team of clerks and uh, Spice for all their assistance throughout this inquiry. And personally, can I thank all my fellow committee members for um, their uh, diligence during the inquiry and their general good conduct throughout. Thank you very much. And at this point, we will go into private session. Thank you.